after my lecture before the forum, it happened that at a concert at Carter Theater in Princeton, we met Einstein. It may be that he made up his mind to show a little of his change of heart in order to erase the impression of rejection he had left me over a year earlier. During the intermission, he stood up, greeted us from his seat a short distance away, and asked me to sit and chat with him. I took a temporarily vacant seat in the row in front of him, turning my head to hear him speak. There was something very unusual in this man. I am not a hero worshipper, more nearly an iconoclast. Great names do not startle me, nor do they make me feel humble. But in Einstein, I felt, this time, something I had not felt on meeting him in Berlin. When he was a jolly man in his early forties, who had achieved singular and spectacular success, which was still new to him, and I was still in my twenties. Nor, when I spent time with him, again in New York in the spring of 1940, nor when I visited him in the summer of 1946. In 1921, he was a young-looking man with well-filled cheeks, warm and sparkling eyes, a forehead framed by dark wavy hair and his mustache over soft lips, uh, with a ready laugh, almost the likeness of a bon vivant Epstein, who portrayed him several years later as flimsy, furrowed, and wiry, did not succeed at all. Now, thirty years later, at the age of seventy-four, the change in his appearance was very great. He had grown old, yet stood erect, with his gray white hair now long falling on his collar. He had a kind face and a clear and sonorous voice. Sufferings and private losses in human destiny had cleansed him and spiritualized him. He looked at me with kindness and warmly pressed my hand with his own fleshy hand. The madness of his face lit up. I reminded him of the scripta on which we had worked together in Berlin. This made him wonder aloud on the mystery of time. Is time a stream flowing always in one direction, from the present to the past? Do the present, future, and past still exist? All exist simultaneously? He wondered, he wondered, and asked me. Yet he brought counter-argument to his own thought. But we cannot remember things that are in the future. This did not appear to me to be a valid argument, but I did not say so. Instead, I referred to Plato's discourse on simultaneous existence of the past and the future. The field of parapsychology deals with such problems. Yes, once I wrote and published something on the subject, and Freud commented in a letter, Einstein asked me whether I still had Freud's letters, and whether he could read one. I promised to select a letter for him to read, and we continued so. Already old friends, when the bell called the audience into the hall, I returned to my seat. I sent Einstein the letter of Freud that he wished to see. In that particular letter, Freud wrote me, as usual by longhand, that he had similar, almost identical ideas, and that he would subscribe to the preface to my work written by Eugene Bleuler. A single week passed. There was again a concert at McCarter Theater. Einstein hardly showed himself twice a year in public, but this time he came again. Again, during the intermission, he sat across the aisle. He asked me to take the vacant seat next to him. Some of the Princeton graduate students sat in a row in front of my wife, as she could hear them wondering at this fellowship. Einstein, when in public, was of course the center of attention, though the public tried not to make this too obvious. Einstein spoke of religion and mentioned Spinoza, a spirit toward whom he probably felt affinity. Like himself, Spinoza was a lonely man. Like himself, he was not concerned with material goods. And, like himself, he was in conflict with men. Though he was kind and humane, and like himself, he was deeply religious. Though not in the church or synagogue. And it is no wonder, if one considers the great sufferings to which his mentor, Uriel Acosta was subjected, one of the saddest chapters, but Spinoza was an Aristotelian, without wishing to be so. The cold reason which insists on explaining away anything unusual or singular separated Aristotle from his teacher Plato, who tended to the esoteric, the wonderful, and the singular.
Not long after my wife and I received an invitation to have tea with Einstein. The day before our visit, I found in the mail a letter in which the writer, a resident of Seaford in England, wrote, The authorities will object to your subversion of their life work, but it is from their minor followers that the bitterest opposition will come. Those who exercise authority are not so shocked by rebellion as their underlings. They are doubly offended, for you threaten their security and insult their judgment. The one Roman Catholic I would expect to sympathize with my doubts on infallibility would be His Holiness. It is the hedge priest and Sunday school teacher who would cry blasphemy. Black triangles are a class of unidentified flying objects with certain common features which have reportedly been observed since the 1940s to present. Reports of black triangles generally originate from the United States and Britain. Reports generally describe this class of UFOs as enormous, silent, black triangular crafts hovering or slowly cruising at low altitudes over cities and highways, usually at night, making no attempt to evade detection. They just sit there. It's like they're just like, here I am, see me. I'm America's most classified airframe. I guess that's kind of uh, what they call soft disclosure. These crafts are often described as having running lights, either bright white lights or pulsing colored lights that appear at each corner of the triangle. Now this reprint of the TR-3B of the TR-3B specifications claim is based on information generally credited to Edgar Fouché, who claimed involvement. I've seen his video; it's quite good. Who claimed involvement with this project in the 1990s? We make no claims about whether this is factually accurate or not. I'm At this point, I don't think there's any way that they can deny it. I mean, hundreds of thousands of people know about it and have, set, have seen it. It's probably going to be declassified soon, I would imagine. Unless it already is. I would probably think it is. But this story becomes more interesting as time progresses. What was originally considered to be a wacky UFO claim seems to be the benefactor of a great deal of coincidence. As AG research moves forward, simply put, the TR-3B's claim to use an MHD torus field with a virtual plasma of high-pressure mercury is strikingly similar to the unrelated claims of Igor Bukowski about the construction of the Nazi Bell device, as well as anecdotal evidence relating to other instances of AG effects, anti-gravity effects, and mercury in the presence of RF fields. Radio frequency fields, I'm thinking. Additionally, a plasma toroid is the only means of replicating some aspects of Eugene Plektinov's superconductor experiments on a larger scale than achievable through traditional type 2 ceramic superconductors. Plasmas and SCs both absorb magnetic field lines. It should be noted that none of the individuals in any of these claims were aware of each other's existence when they published their work, making the similarities quite striking. The Tactical Reconnaissance, TR-3B's codename, Astra. Now it's interesting, Astra, that's an ancient name that was given to the Vermonas, if I'm not mistaken. First operational flight was in the early 90s. The triangular-shaped nuclear-powered aerospace platform was developed under the top-secret Aurora program with SDI and black budget monies. At least three of the billion-dollar-plus TR-3Bs were flying by 1994. The Aurora is the most classified aerospace development program in existence. The TR-3B is the most exotic vehicle created by the Aurora program. It is funded and operationally tasked by the National Reconnaissance Office, the NSA, and the CIA. The TR-3B flying triangle is not fiction, with technology available in the mid-80s. Not every UFO spotted is one of theirs. The TR-3B vehicle's outer coating is reactive to electrical radar stimulation and can change reflectiveness, radar absorptiveness, and color. This polymer skin, when used in conjunction with the TR-3B's electric countermeasures and ECCM, can make the vehicle look like a small aircraft or a flying cylinder, or even trick radar receivers into falsely detecting a variety of aircraft, no aircraft, or several aircraft at various locations. A circular 
A circular plasma-filled accelerator ring, called the magnetic field disruptor, surrounds the rotatable crew compartment and is far ahead of any imaginable technology. Sandia and Livermore Laboratories developed the reverse-engineered MFD technology. Reverse-engineered? From what? Pray tell. The government will go to any lengths to protect this technology. The plasma, mercury-based, it's all over the internet. It's almost like the stealth fighter when it first got known. Everybody thought it was crazy, and then they started talking about it, and the next thing you know, they just came out with it. It's just about the same thing. The plasma, mercury-based, it's pressurized at 250,000 atmospheres at a temperature of 150 degrees Kelvin and accelerated to 50,000 RPM to create a superconductive plasma with the resulting gravity disruption. The MFD generates a magnetic vortex field which disrupts or neutralizes the effects of gravity on mass within proximity by 89 percent. Do not misunderstand, this is not anti-gravity. Anti-gravity provides a repulsive force that can be used for propulsion. The MFD creates a disruption of the Earth's gravitational field upon the mass with the circular accelerator. The mass of the circular accelerator and all mass within the accelerator, such as the crew capsule, avionics, MFD system, fuels, crew, environmental system, and nuclear reactor are reduced by 89%. This causes the effect of making the vehicle extremely light and able to outperform and outmaneuver any aircraft yet constructed, except, of course, those UFOs we did not build. This was in the Navy video I did. This was our hot rod that I was relating to. The TR-3B is a high-altitude stealth reconnaissance platform with an indefinite loiter time. And it also has weapons on board, as you'll see. Once you get it up there at speed, once you get it up there at speed, it doesn't take much propulsion to maintain altitude. At Groom Lake, there have been whispered rumors of a new element that acts as a catalyst to the plasma. With the vehicle mass reduced by 89%, the craft can travel at Mach 9, vertically or horizontally. My sources say performance is limited only the stresses that the human pilots can endure, which is a lot, really, considering along with the 89% reaction in mass, the G-forces are also reduced by 89%. The TR-3B's propulsion is provided by three multi-mode thrusters mounted at each bottom corner of the triangular platform. The TR-3B is a sub Mach 9 vehicle until it reaches altitudes above 120,000 feet. Then God knows how fast it can go. The multi-mode rocket engines mounted under each corner of the craft use hydrogen or methane as oxygen and oxygen as propellant. In a liquid oxygen hydrogen rocket system, 85% of the propellant mass is oxygen. The nuclear thermal rocket engine uses hydrogen propellant augmented with oxygen for additional thrust. The reactor heats the liquid hydrogen and injects liquid oxygen in the supersonic nozzle so that the hydrogen burns concurrently in the liquid oxygen afterburner. The multi-mold propulsion system can operate in the atmosphere with thrust provided by the nuclear reactor. In the upper atmosphere with hydrogen propulsion and in orbit with the combined hydrogen-oxygen propulsion. What you have to remember is that the three rocket engines only have to propel 11% of the mass of the top secret TR-3B. The engines are reportedly built by Rockwell. Many sightings of triangular UFOs are not alien vehicles but top secret TR-3B. The NSA, NRO, CIA, and USAF have been playing a shell game with aircraft nomenclature, creating the TR-3B modified to the TR-3A. The TR-3B and their tier 2, 3, and 4 with suffixes like plus or minus added on to confuse further the fact that each of these designators is a different aircraft and not the same aerospace vehicle. A TR-3B is as different from the TR-3A as a banana is from a grape. Some of these vehicles are manned and others are not. Very interesting indeed. Arctic Ocean in the north and the Kalima in the east. In Worlds in Collision, page 329, I expressed my belief that human settlements would be discovered farther to the north on the Kalima or Lena rivers flowing into the Arctic Ocean. On the lower Lena, north of the confluence with Philly, inside the polar circle. Monuments are found of a characteristic culture. Outstanding finds were made near Lake Yolba, not far from Gigantsk. As soon as the archaeologists started a methodic investigation of the area, 
in Yakutsk itself was found a workshop of an ancient metallurgist, in which, at the end of the second millennium, before the present era, he made bronze axes similar to the axes manufactured about that time in the Near East and in Europe. In the Yatutsk Taiga, two and a half or three thousand years ago, there already lived artisans in metals who were able to extract copper from ore, to melt it and pour it into forms, and to make axes, beautiful bronze tips for the spears, knives, and even swords. These relics of a civilization in the Tiega of northwestern Siberia imply that the climate changed there in the age of advanced man. Before the ice froze the region, voracious members of the elephant family roamed there in large herds. Recent Finds in Geology Archaeological evidence of continental upheavals in the second millennium having been presented in detail by Schaefer, the evidence of geology and paleontology called for elucidation. To this, I have dedicated a special work, now close to completion, and since it will be published before very long, I shall refer here only briefly to some of this material. A little over a decade ago, it was observed that in the gold-digging hydraulic giants in Fairbanks District in Alaska, seleucing out miles-long cuts opened great hecatombs of animals. Their numbers are appalling. The Bronze Age may have been well on its way in the centers of ancient civilization. Palms were found to have grown in northern Greenland, where now for half a year there is darkness, and it is permanently cold. At some time in the remote past, corals grew in Spitsbergen and sequoia forests in Alaska, and it was early understood that the terrestrial axis must have changed its position. Airy, Lord Calvin, George Darwin, and many others, including Schiaparelli and Simon Newcomb participated in a long debate on the astronomical and geological possibility of a sudden change in the direction of the terrestrial axis. A debate that was erroneously thought to have started as a consequence of worlds in collision. It was understood that such a change must have taken place unless the strange finds are to be left without explanation. The theory of drifting continents offered as a substitute was rejected for many reasons. Jeffrey showed that the mobile force invoked by Wagner is 100 billion times too small to prove to move the continents. Eddington thought that possibly only the crust in its entirety moved, and the axis of the core was left unchanged in direction. But the mobile force he invoked, the tidal inequalities of lunar origin, would not have moved the latitudes out of their places, the directional pull being east to west. W. B. Wright, in his The Quaternary Ice Age, 2nd edition, 1937, says that during geological history there occurred many changes in the position of the climatic zones on the surface of the earth, which cannot be explained except by a shifting of the axis or a displacement of the pole from its present position. But what could have brought about a change in the inclination of the terrestrial axis to the plane of the ecliptic? I discussed this question in the closing pages of Worlds in Collision and suggested the entrance of the earth into a strong magnetic field. The newly developed science of paleomagnetism brought and daily continues to bring confirmation of the fact that lavas and igneous rocks in all parts of the world are reversely magnetized. But what is even more startling is to find that the reversely magnetized rocks are a hundred times more strongly magnetized than the Earth's magnetic field could have caused them to be. H. Manley, in his review, writes, It may seem strange that a rock which is made magnetic by the Earth's field should become so strongly magnetized compared to 
the generating force. This is one of the most astonishing problems of paleomagnetism. Manley also refers to the tests made years ago by G. Fulgumerator and P. L. Mercanton on the clay of ancient Etruscan vases. They were found to have been fired when the vases were closer to the south magnetic pole. Their position during the firing is known because of the flow of the glaze, and the magnetic dip or inclination of the clay is found. Manley writes, This implies that in the 6th century BC, the Earth's magnetic field was reversed in the central Mediterranean area. He speaks also of a general reversal in historical times, 2,500 years ago, that must be cleared up by additional research. Knowing from my study of ancient literary sources, the proper time of exogenous disturbances in terrestrial rotation, I suspected an inaccuracy in the last sentence of an otherwise well-written article by Manley. The reversal must have occurred in the 8th century and again in the beginning of the 7th, minus 687. I was gratified to find in the original publication of Professor Mercanton, to whom I directed my inquiry, that the vases with reversed polarity date from the 8th century. I expect that, should the research be extended to vases dating from the end of the Middle Kingdom in Egypt, circa 3,500 years ago, other periods of unnatural polarity would be determined in Egypt and elsewhere. Professor R. Daly of Harvard University found that 3,500 years ago, all over the world, the level of the ocean suddenly dropped. He thought it might be due to a sudden sinking of the crust. And in an authoritative work, Marine Geology, 1950, Professor P. H. Kunin of the Netherlands finds that this recent shift is now well established. On observations, in many places of the world, and he too assigns this catastrophic drop of the ocean level to 3,500 years ago. The recent expedition of the Oceanographic Institute at Gothenburg under H. Peterson, which covered the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans, found, according to its leader, evidences of great catastrophes that have altered the face of the earth. He speaks of climatic catastrophes and of tectonic catastrophes that raised or lowered the ocean bottom hundreds, even thousands of feet, spreading huge tidal waves which destroyed plant and animal life on the coastal plains at many places. A lava bed of geologically recent origin was covered only by a thin veneer of sediment. He discovered that the Pacific and Indian ocean beds consist largely of volcanic ash that had settled on the bottom after great volcanic explosions. He also found a large nickel content in the clay of the ocean bottoms and decided that this abysmal nickel must have been of meteoric origin. Consequently, he concludes, there were very heavy showers of meteors. The principal difficulty of this explanation is that it requires a rate of accretion of meteoric dust several hundred times greater than that which astronomers are presently prepared to admit. Professor Ewing of Columbia University carried on his investigation in the Atlantic in 1949. He published his results and, like Peterson, found that lava spread only recently on the bottom of the ocean. He also came upon signs of land deep on the bottom of the ocean and concluded either the land must have sunk two to three miles or the sea must have been two or three miles lower than now. Either conclusion is startling. The pollen analysis made by various scientists of the bottom of the North Sea between Germany, England, Scotland, and Norway convinced researchers that this area, in its present shape, originated only very recently. In the subreal, the date of 1500 before the present era, often being selected. At that time, there occurred a climasters. Once there had been a sea. Then it was covered by debris carried from the mountains of Norway. 
Later, in a catastrophic advance, the North Sea was formed once more. Human artifacts have been found from time, from the time when the North Sea was land. The investigation of the Delta formation of the Bear River on the Alaskan border, very carefully made by Hansen, showed that at the present rate of sedimentation, the Delta is estimated to be only 3,600 years old. A. D. Le Parent, the leading French geologist of the beginning of the century, calculated that since the time the Rhone glacier started to melt, less than 3,000 years have passed. Modern research confirms that many of the alpine glaciers are less than 4,000 years old. Professor Flint of Yale refers to the redetermination of the age of the upper Great Gorge of Niagara Falls and writes, 1947. The age of the Upper Great Gorge is calculated as somewhat more than 4,000 years, and to obtain even this low figure, we have to assume that the rate of recession has been constant, although we know that discharge has in fact varied greatly during post-glacial times. Sir Nander and others demonstrated that in 1500 and again after minus 1800, Sir Nander and others demonstrated that in minus 1500 and again after minus 800, there occurred climatic catastrophes of global dimensions. These researches, unknown to me when I wrote Worlds in Collision, coincide completely with my conclusions and their dating. In both these periods, the lake dwellings in Switzerland, Germany, northern Italy, and also in Scandinavia were overwhelmed by high water catastrophes and abandoned, the first time for four centuries, the second time never to be rebuilt. H. Gams and R. Norhaden showed with very extensive documentation that at these two time dates, the lakes of Europe were tilted, and many of them, like Essi and Federsi, were emptied of all their water. The Isartel in the Bavarian Alps was violently torn out, and this in very recent times, and in the Entel in the Tyrol, the many changes of riverbeds were indicative of ground movements on a great scale. H. D. Terra of the Carnegie Institute and Peterson of Harvard came to the conclusion that the Himalayas, in violent upheavals, reached their present form and height in the age of man, partly even in the time of advanced man. The same conclusion is made concerning the Andes, where, too, the upheaval must have been catastrophic. In the age of man, the Andes rose many thousands of feet amid volcanic activity. In the hills of Montreal and New Hampshire and in Michigan, hey. five and six hundred feet above sea level, bones of whales have been found. In many places on the earth, in all continents, bones of sea animals and polar land animals and tropical animals have been found in great melees. So also in the Cumberland Cave in Maryland, and in the Chakotin Fisher in China, and in Germany and Denmark, hippopotami and ostriches were found together with seals and reindeer. Wherever we turn our interest, from the Arctic to the Antarctic, and from sunrise to sunset, in the high mountains and in the deep seas, we find innumerable signs of great upheavals, ancient and recent. A circular meteoric crater, Chubb Crater, was discovered in the summer of 1950 in northern Labrador. It covers an area of four square miles. It is much larger than the Arizona Crater, which is four-fifths of a mile in diameter, two-thirds of a square mile in area, whereas the Arizona Crater could accommodate two million people in its amphitheater. The Chubb Crater could accommodate 12 million people. It must have been created by the impact of an asteroid, according to the published opinion of geological authorities. The asteroid must have fallen about 4,000 years ago, following or shortly preceding the discovery of the Chubb Crater, several other large meteoric craters were discovered in Australia, Arabia, and Mexico. 
the tens of thousands of oval formations on the Atlantic coast of the United States, especially in the Carolinas. Some of them, attaining a length of a few miles each, were conclusively identified in a monograph by W. F. Prouty, 1952, as having been caused by a fall of large meteorites. And finally, the largest crater formations situated in Quebec, north of Sept Isles, in Canada, and occupying an area of 680 square miles. This <laughs> is under investigation as to its meteoric origin by a group of mines department scientists led by Dr. M. J. S. Inns. Of the many other new developments in the field of geology, I would stress some of the results obtained by the radiocarbon method. The time of the Ice Age is moved much closer to our time. Instead of 25,000 years as, as the terminal date of the last glacial period, it is shown that 10,000 or 11,000 years ago, the ice was still advancing. And even with this low dating, there remain puzzling exceptions. Among them, the finding of mastodons and mammoths in strata only 3,500 years old. Moreover, organic vestiges in the drift of the last glaciation have been found to be of a radiocarbon age pointing to a time 3,500 years ago. Radiocarbon analysis of oil has also shown that in the deposits of the Gulf of Mexico, the age of the oil is measured in thousands of years, not millions. This destroys the main arguments the geologists have raised against the theory of the exogenous origin of some deposits of oil. World's Inclusion, page 53, 58, and 369. Hydrocarbons have been identified in cometary tails by spectral analysis. Also, carbohydrates, edible products. But here, we are already outside the domain of geology and in the realm of astronomy. World's Inclusion in Recent Finds in Astronomy In the years when the manuscript of World's Collision was in the hands of the Macmillan Company, accepted for publication, though not yet published, 1946-49, and in the years following, though not yet published, 1946-49, the zodiacal light, or the glow seen in the evening sky after sunset, stretching in the path of the sun and other planets, ecliptic, the mysterious origin of which has for a long time occupied the minds of astronomers, has been explained in recent years as the reflection of the solar light from the two rings of dust particles, one following the orbit of Venus, the other an orbit between Mars and Jupiter, places where, according to worlds in collision, collisions of planets and a comet took place. The origin of asteroids, or small planets, that circle between Jupiter and Mars, some of which cross the orbit of Mars, and even that of the Earth, has lately been explained as the result of the explosion of a planet, or more recently, 1950, as the result of a collision between two planets in an early age, Kuiper. N.T. of the Perkins Observatory offered a new in his own explanation of the origin of the asteroids. They are remnants of a gigantic prehistoric comet. F. Whipple, upon calculating the orbits of the asteroids, came to the conclusion, 1950, two collisions occurred between these bodies and a comet once 4,700 years ago and the second time 1,500 years ago, or within historical times. These dates of collision in the solar system are of the same order as those offered in Worlds in Collision. Deduce there from historical evidence and testimony of C. Tumbaugh, the discoverer of Pluto, explained, 1950. The dark areas and the canals of Mars are resulting from collisions of Mars with asteroids. According to Worlds in Collision, Mars was involved in repeated collisions with large cometary masses. Actually, in January 1950, an explosion observed on Mars 
was interpreted by Openick as a collision with an asteroid. Clouds of dust of continental dimensions rose and screened surface features of the planet. O. Sturvey of Yerkes Observatory reviewed the achievements of astronomy during 1950, wrote that by a bizarre coincidence in that year, a deluge of sound papers on collisions within the solar system followed on the heels of worlds in collision. There are two theories concerning the origin of lunar craters. Their size is enormous. Nothing comparable is known on Earth. According to one theory, these craters are the result of a collision of the moon with very large meteorites of the size of asteroids. According to the other theory, they are volcanic formations. Both theories assumed very violent events in which the celestial body closest to the Earth was involved. In Worlds in Collision, I offered the following explanation of the lunar craters, as well as of the seas of lava and the rifts of the lunar surface. During the great catastrophes, when the moon, together with the terrestrial globe, passed through the fabric of a great comet, and again, when in the 8th century before the present era, the Earth and the moon were strongly perturbed by Mars. The moon's surface flowed with lava and bubbled into great circular formations, which rapidly cooled off in the long lunar night, unprotected by an atmosphere from the coolness of cosmic spaces. In these cosmic collisions and near contacts, the surface of the moon was also marked by clefts and rifts. If the circular formations on the moon are these bubbles which collapsed, then probably there are smaller bubbles on the moon that have not yet burst. Dr. H. Percy Wilkins, the English selenographer, actually found over 40 unexploded bubbles or domes on the moon. The moon, 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 several of which lie to the northeast of Copernicus Crater. The largest of these is found within Darwin Crater and is 20 miles in diameter. According to an article by F. Benario in Vega, 1953, I have expressed my opinion that many comets are of recent origin, and I have supported this view by reference to the frequency and luminosity of comets in the days of Imperial Rome in comparison to the number of comets visible to the unaided eye in the last centuries. This notion received vigorous confirmation in the extensive work on comets done in Soviet Russia by a leading authority on the subject, Professor S. K. Veskenviatsky. His research reveals that periodic comets, as observed during recent decades, are losing their luminosity and their matter at a rate so rapid that 50 or 60 revolutions suffice to degenerate a comet completely. Thus, the Halley Comet can hardly go back beyond 3,500 years, or the year 1500 before the present era. In the last century, several comets with short periods have failed to return, having apparently lost all their matter and a few others actually fell apart before the eyes of observers. The rapid decay of comets excludes the possibility that they have belonged to our solar system from the beginning. <laughs> or from the time the planets were formed. The theory that sees in comets bodies that arrived from other solar systems has been generally abandoned. Vetehovsky, Vete, man, that's a tough name. Vesvietsky, Vetsvietsky also shows why we must reject a theory of the capture of comets from a cloud of dust and gases through which our solar system presumably passed some time in the past. He comes to the conclusion that the comets were born in eruptions from planets. 
even from satellites like our moon, where circular formations indicate violent events in the past. But the main activity must have taken place on Jupiter and Saturn. And what are we seeing right now? Jupiter and Saturn have new moons, and they're small. The major planets, as the form of orbits of the short period comet suggest, this is a revival of the theory of R. Proctor, who 70 years ago ascribed the origin of the so-called Jovian family of comets comprising the, the majority of comets of short periods to eruptions from Jupiter. The gases of Jupiter and Saturn are in violent motion despite their low temperatures, yet the velocity ne necessary for escape from the major planets is so great, 60 kilometers per second from Jupiter, that Vesiavatsky admits not knowing the mechanism that could, in conditions presently prevailing on major planets, impart this velocity to the exploded matter. Nevertheless, Vesifiatsky insists that in the recent past, conditions on these planets must have been such that this was possible, even if these conditions cannot be defined. He emphasizes that by casting off the exploded matter, planets must have changed their own masses and consequently their orbits. They must also have experienced recoils. And that's what I thought, shedding matter while they're moving away. Yes, that would be acclimating their charge, wouldn't it? In the publications of the Kiev Observatory for 1953, Visa Vyatsky says, the history of the planetary system was characterized, we assume, by definitely more rapid changes and more active physical processes than appeared when only gravitational interrelations in the solar system were taken into account. All this is in complete harmony with the conclusions at which I arrived in Worlds in Collision. Concerning the time, a few thousand years ago, of the birth of comets, of short periods, and their origin, by eruption from the planets, especially the major planets. There I also explained the forces or conditions that caused the major planets to reject the cometary masses. The near collision between major planets brought about the birth of comets. Now my claim, based on historical material, that the composition of the solar system was changed in historical times, is given the support of observation and calculation. The electromagnetic nature of the universe, deduced in worlds and collision from a series of historical phenomena, is supported by another series of recent observations. At Evans Signal Laboratory of the United States Army Signal Corps in Belmar, New Jersey, researchers conducting pioneer experiments on the reception of radar echoes from the moon detected noises coming from the sun. These noises point to discharges of strong potentials. In the fall of 1947, at the meeting of the British Association for the Advancement of Science, Sir Eben Appleton reported that radio noises coming from the sun coincide with solar flares. According to him, a sunspot is the most powerful ultra-short wave radio station known, its power being much greater than a million kilowatts. In 1948 and 49, Donald Menzel produced motion pictures of prominences or explosions of matter on the sun. They were made at the Solar Observatory in Climax, Colorado. What a name. The exposed matter rose at a very great speed to immense heights, all the time gaining in velocity, and then descended to the sun, not in a curved path as a missile would do, but by retreating on the path it covered, comparable to a missile reversing its direction and returning to its point of departure.
Moreover, the velocity of its descent was without the acceleration expected in a fall, and this, too, was in violation of gravitational mechanics. It has been observed that when perturbances or surges of exploded matter on the sun run into one another, both of them recoil violently. Such observation was made by McMath and Sawyer, and on another occasion by Lyot. The conclusion drawn by E. Pettit of the Mount Wilson Observatory in 1951 is that solar perturbances are electrically charged. Above the perturbances, the coronal structure is often bent into the form of an arch, sometimes into several concentric arches. This is additional evidence of the electrical nature of the perturbances and corona. In the configuration of the cometary nuclei and tails, there was found good evidence that all particles in the comet influence the motion of each other, and in the configuration of the streamers in the tails of many comets strongly indicate a mutual repulsion. Thus wrote Professor N. T. Rabravinikov, director of the Perkins Observatory, 1951, it is also calculated that the repulsion of the tails of the comets by the sun is 20,000 times stronger than the gravitational attraction, and the implication is that it cannot be caused by the pressure of light, as previously thought, and that electrical repulsion must be in action. From spectral analysis, it is known that the cometary tails do not shine merely by reflected light, and that their light is not caused by combustion either, but most probably is an electrical effect comparable to the effect of a Geissler tube. In order to explain the general magnetic field of the terrestrial globe, Dr. E. C. Bullard of Great Britain's National Physical Laboratory assumed electrical currents in the liquid metal core of the Earth. The polar lights have been explained by various scientists as electrical charges arriving from the sun. Following disturbances on the sun, there is an immediate disturbance in the ionosphere and radio transmission, ground currents, and the magnetic field of the earth. There is also a second retarded but pronounced reaction about 25 hours later, and auroral displays. In 1948, Enrico Fermi explained the electromagnetically high charges of the cosmic rays as a result of the positive particles having traveled through magnetic fields in space. In 1951, Rich Meyer and Teller followed an earlier idea of Swan, explained these charges as originating from the sun. Protons and heavy nuclei could be accelerated to the enormous velocity of cosmic ray particles by an extended magnetic field of solar origin. Both theories assume the existence of magnetic fields in space. I could add to this that if the Earth is a negatively charged body, the great energy with which positive charges, the cosmic rays, rush toward the Earth is not in the least enigmatic. Holy kind of gives pause for those microbursts that one guy talks about. I mean, the sun could probably sneeze half an earth and send it our way, and it would immediately bury whatever it landed on. And maybe that's the reason oceans become mountains and mountains become oceans. Come to think of it, that's a scary thought. It would just be a matter of time. I hope those are giant spaceships shooting whatever comes out of the sun. <laughs> And you got all these billionaires talking about getting off planet. See, what do they know that we don't? Well, maybe... The admonitions of Mott. Concepts of living in balance. I guess when they die, they're supposed to be able to say this. And they get weighed, you know, with the feather. And uh, if they're lying, they get eaten up by that creature. But, um... I just wanted to read them and see how... Well, there's quite a few of them, so let's read them. I have not committed sin. I have not committed robbery with violence. 
I have not stolen. I have not slain men and women. I have not stolen food. I have not swindled offerings. I have not stolen from God. I have not told lies. I have not carried away food. I have not cursed. I have not closed my ears to truth. Interesting. I have not committed adultery. I have not made anyone cry. I have not felt sorrow without reason. I guess that's uh, not a good thing. It's kind of a sin to be sad without a reason. I would think that would be like someone who's depressed. That's interesting. Uh, I remember hearing something too where Saturn punishes the melancholy. Yeah, it's, I guess it wouldn't be a good thing, would it? I don't remember ever being sad without cause. I have not committed... Uh, oh, I read that. All right. I have not assaulted anyone. I am not deceitful. I have not stolen anyone's land. I have not been an eavesdropper. Mm. I have not falsely accused anyone. I have not been angry without reason. I have not seduced anyone's wife. I have not polluted myself. Interesting. I have not terrorized anyone. I have not disobeyed the law. I have not been excessively angry. I have not cursed God. I have not behaved with violence. I have not caused disruption of peace. I have not acted hastily or without thought. I have not overstepped my boundaries of concern. Hmm. I have not exaggerated my words when speaking. I have not worked evil. I have not used evil thoughts, words, or deeds. I have not polluted the water. I have not spoken angrily or arrogantly. I have not cursed anyone in thought, word, or deed. I have not placed myself on a pedestal. I have not stolen that which belongs to God. I have not stolen from or disrespected the deceased. I have not taken food from a child. I have not acted with insolence. I have not destroyed property belonging to God. 42. Hmm. Yeah, that's pretty good. I like that. <laughs> the virtues of Ma. Yeah, we already read that, but I'll read it again. Control of thoughts, control of actions, devotion to purpose, have a faith in the ability of your teacher to teach you the truth, have faith in yourself to assimilate to truth, to the truth, to assimilate the truth, have faith in themselves to wield truth, be free from resentment under the experience of persecution, be free from resentment under the experience of wrong, cultivate the ability to distinguish between right and wrong and cultivate the ability to distinguish between real and unreal. Truth is like lightning. Its errand is done before you hear the thunder. Gerald Massey. Principles of Ma. There they are. I read them already once. And then, and then here's the admonitions of Ma. Time was ripe for a heresy. 180 years ago, in 1773, Pierre Simon de Laplace, 1749-1827, then 23 years old, stood before the Académie des Sciences in Paris and read a paper in which he proved the stability of the solar system. All deflections of the planets from their paths are only periodic oscillations from their main courses and the celestial mechanism is wound up to go on forever. Laplace's contemporary, Jean Patrice Lamarck, 1744-1829, set out to demonstrate in a series of works that this earth has ever been a peaceful abode of evolution, free from spasmodic disturbances, in opposition to the dominant ways of his day. These ideas of harmony or stability in the celestial and terrestrial spheres gained ground in the 19th century and became the foundation of scientific thought. In 1846, Leverrier, by announcing the existence of the planet Neptune, which was immediately thereafter discovered in the part of the sky indicated by him, proved the gravitational theory of Newton and the orderly universe of Laplace to be correct. However, in the same year, by detecting the anomaly in the revolution of Mercury, always accumulating in one and the same direction, he threw the first doubt on the infallibility of these very laws. The theory of uniformity, as understood by Lamarck, and Hutton was developed by Lyle, became the cornerstone of Darwinian theory, and Darwin 
went so far as to say that anybody who was unconvinced by Lyle's teaching should refrain from reading The Origin of Species. The principle of uniformity, or the explanation of all past events in the history of the globe, and in terms of the processes in action in our own age, or the denial of catastrophic crisis in the past, gave Darwin what he needed most for his idea of the origin of species, almost unlimited time, in order that from the struggle for existence or competition, new forms should evolve, and that an animal like the spider with its many legs and human beings should have had a common ancestor. Untold eons were necessary. By the end of the 19th century, the war between the theory of evolution and the theory of creation in six days, less than 6,000 years ago, was concluded with victory to the theory of evolution. The difficulty left was, in the view of Thomas Huxley, that no really new species had appeared on the world scene since the scientific observations were made, not even the breeding experiments. The breeding experiments? <laughs> Just what would that be about? Very interesting. The geological record, however, spoke unequivocally of the fact, in the past, lived animal forms that do not live any longer. And of those forms that live in our age, many were not present in the geological past. Laplace's theory of the origin of the solar system, of a rotating nebula, was replaced by the end of the century with a theory of a catastrophic beginning in a near collision of the sun with another star with debris forming the planets. Isn't that interesting? And what star was that other star? And where did that information come from? I'd like to know. But it was stressed by the authors of this new theory that the universe is orderly. And this beginning in a cataclysm was an unusually rare occurrence in the cosmos. And that the solar system is governed by the principle of stability, as enunciated by Laplace, and the earth by law of uniformity. And the animals and plants by the law of evolution, through continuity. It appeared that basic principles having been established, science had before it only the work of refinement and observation, and in the addition of details for perfection of knowledge. But the time of basic discoveries was over. This was the outlook in 1895. In April of that year, Friedrich Hoffmansen, in an attempt to discover the North Pole, reached a point less than four degrees from it. The scientific world looked upon the discovery of the North Pole as the most coveted goal still left to be attained by science. But before Nansen, drifting from latitude 86.14, reached his home in Norway, the scene changed. Conrad Röntgen of Würzburg discovered the X-rays, or cathode rays, that pass through opaque bodies, covering all kinds of things. <laughs> In the same year of 1895, 20-year-old Marconi, working at the home of his father near Bologna, made the first successful experiment with wireless transmission. Okay, now I have read that he ripped off Tesla when he was his understudy, and that Bologna was notorious for having self-important tricksters and evildoers, <laughs> intellectuals there, that were made fun of by a comedy troupe, and that's where the saying, you're full of baloney, came from. That year, too, Sigmund Freud published his first paper, together with Joseph Brewer, which led to a new understanding of the realm known as the subconscious. And at the same time, Pavlov made his contribution to the psychology of the reflexes. Pavlov's dog. The next year, and still before Nansen had landed on the Norwegian coast, Henry Becquerel, working on uranium, discovered the phenomena of radioactivity. Two years later, he was followed by the Curies, who discovered radium. In 1897, J.J. Thompson announced that the atom is divisible and is actually a microcosm. And he was followed by Rutherford. In 1900, 
Planck presented the theory of quanta, or energies dispatched in bundles or shots, and not in a continuous stream. And in the field of origin of species, in 1900, Van Vries announced mutations in plants, observed for the first time a process of spontaneous changes in living nature fundamentally different from the process of evolution through continuity as postulated by Darwin. Thus, in a few years, in a spectacular series of discoveries, the entire world, matter and energy, and living species, and the human soul, opened new horizons, and everything appeared to be incessant vibration, collisions, and transformation, the macrocosm, the microcosm, and even the subtle world of the mind, all alike. That's interesting. It's just like that today. And in 1905, Albert Einstein, then 26 years old, offered his understanding of the physical world, an understanding that required a new mental approach, or so it was thought, and single-handedly set science back 150 years. I've heard it said before that just prior to World War I, there was a major wake-up going on. That kind of makes you think about, hmm, World War I ruined everything. When it was over, and after the Spanish flu killed another 50 million people, Salvador Dali and Einstein emerged. How about that? As a testimonial that the age of basic discoveries had not ended with the victory of Darwin over the book of Genesis, in their minds. Since then, another 50 years have passed. Once more, as before, the end of the 19th century. We are told that the fundamentals are all known. The age of basic discoveries is definitely terminated, this time for certain, and present and future generations will have to satisfy themselves with detecting details, accumulating data, and adding decimals. And though the exciting decade of 1895 to 1905 threw light on processes, on processes in matter, life, and soul, processes that are certainly not inert and are marked by spontaneity and conflict. Science in its various branches adjusted the new discoveries and ideas to the framework of the old great principle reigning equally in lifeless and living nature. The law of harmony and unperturbed stability. The time was ripe for heresy. In 1950, a book, Worlds in Collision, created an outburst of emotions almost unprecedented in science. I came upon the idea that traditions and legends and memories of generic origin can be treated in the same way in which we treat psychoanalysis. The early memories of a single individual. I spent ten years on this work. I found that the collective memory of humankind spoke of a series of global catastrophes that occurred in historical times. I believe that I could even identify the exact times and the very agents of the great upheavals of the more recent past. The conclusions at which I arrived compelled me to cross the frontiers into various fields of science, archaeology, geology, and astronomy. The result was a book a prolegomenon in its concluding pages, I conceded that more problems were raised than had been solved, and I promised, always reckoning with the limitations of the individual scholar, Ouch. to pursue my study into these fields too. But already the implications of the fact of great global catastrophes on the earth, one of the celestial bodies in a time so recent, had caused my critics to assert, in the words of a Harvard astronomer, that here was the most amazing example of a shattering of accepted concepts on record. In the heat of the debate, in the press of the book, was pronounced one of the most significant books written since the invention of printing, and also the worst book since the invention of movable characters. <laughs> Believing that an emotional atmosphere is not well suited to fruitful debate. Fascinating. Fascinating. I have entered only infrequently into the controversy. I have made short factual corrections of statements by the Royal Astronomer and by J. S. Haldane, B. S. Haldane, appearing in their reviews of my book, and I participated in a debate 
with your professor of astronomy, J.Q. Stewart, in the pages of Harper's Magazine, June 1951. I appeared before the American Philosophical Society, which, at its annual meeting in April 1952, held a symposium on some orthodoxies of modern science. My unorthodoxy being the chief subject on the agenda. Otherwise, I have kept myself out of the verbal conflict. Now, more than three and a half years have passed since the publication of the book, and I appreciate the opportunity offered me by your invitation to present a dispassionate review of recent finds in the three fields named in the title of my address. Worlds in Collision and recent finds in archaeology. In my book, I describe the great natural catastrophes of the second and first millennia before the present era. Prominence is given to the description of the natural upheaval that occurred in the closing hours of the Middle Kingdom in Egypt. I synchronized this event with the Exodus, when sea, land, and sky were in uproar. The collective human memory retained an inexhaustible array of recollections of the time when the world was in conflagration, when sea engulfed land, earth trembled, celestial bodies were disturbed in their motion, the meteorites fell. My narrative is based on historical texts of many peoples around the globe, on classical literature, on epics of northern races, on sacred books of the Orient and Occident, on traditions and folklore of primitive people. The question that arose was, where's the archaeological evidence? In later chapters of my book, I gave such evidence. Water clocks and sundials that show a different length of the day or altered latitudes, change in orientation of ancient temples, which originally faced toward the east, but do so no longer. I also closely examined in my book the calendars of the civilized peoples of antiquity, from Mexico and Peru to Greece, Iran, Israel, Egypt, Babylon, Assyria, India, and China, and the calendar reforms that were made. All this material gave strong support to the literary evidence. Working independently of me, Professor Claude Schaefer, whose earlier excavations at Raz Shamara, Ugarit, caused a complete revolution in biblical exegesis, published a volume, Stratigraphie Comparé et Chronologio, Chronolo, Chronolo, G.D. Lasse Occidental, printed by Oxford University Press. In this very detailed and technical work, comprising together with tables, almost a thousand pages. Schaefer demonstrates that on several occasions, each marking the end of an epoch, the entire ancient East was shaken and devastated. Modern annals of seismology know nothing comparable in severity and extent. The most devastating of these upheavals took place at exactly the end of the Middle Kingdom in Egypt, causing its downfall, as claimed in Worlds in Collision and Ages in Chaos. Cities were overturned. Epidemics left the dead piled in common graves. <laughs> I came back to John Cook's uh, Saturn Cosmology. When I read that by him, or essay, chapter, uh, I was intrigued by these highlights of new findings that were just beneath it. One of the reasons why I think John Cook is worth listening is that he did that in his research. I checked and verified many theories which had been proposed by others about the past. Below I have listed new findings which come out of the attempt to establish a chronology and develop a rational set of mechanics for planetary interactions. Many of these findings have remained unknown or obscured to other investigators. Other items listed below are well established but tend to be avoided or negated by researchers of the catastrophic past. I guess John didn't know about the equilibrium problem with the atmosphere. I am offering this list for those who are familiar with the major elements of the catastrophic literature of Emmanuel Velikovsky and David Talbot. If this is all new to you, skip the rest of this page and proceed to the next chapter. <laughs> <laughs> say it's not new to us, so I think we can handle it. Okay, he's got little bullet points, so no numbers. Okay, the first one. The Earth never turned over, at least not completely, 
and certainly not permanently. This had been suggested by Velikovsky and others. It is a nearly impossible notion. I dispute this and discuss the origins of these ideas in the appendix. Polar relocations disputed. I kind of like that. I, I don't really care for the thought of flipping over. <laughs> Okay, next one. The age of the Earth, Mars, and the Moon are exactly what they seem to be from the most abundant earliest rocks. The ages do not need to be expanded to fit a theory, well, in this case I'd say shortened, of the single creation of the whole solar system, as popular science has done. Ah, details in Appendix A. Well, okay, we'll just keep moving from that one. The, one of the best things about Saturn theory is it doesn't really have a time that it has to fit. Evolution does. That's why gradualism, they need it. Solar system as popular science has done. Details in Appendix A, okay. Saturn probably first entered the solar systems before the Cambrian explosion. The sudden development of new phyla and species could be attributed to a nova event and a mass expulsion of Saturn at that time. Four, the mass extinctions and the speciation events which follow these can be attributed to plasma discharges of Saturn as its orbit repeatedly at regular intervals brought Saturn to an intersection with the solar system. The excursion through the solar system would extend over about 15,000 years. This is discussed in Chapter Nevada Conference. 5. Permian extinction is the second to last nova event of Saturn and occurred at a time when Earth was still on an equatorial orbit about Saturn. It did little to advance life on Earth, taking it backward by a hundred million years. But Earth became a solar system planet after the end of the Permian. The plant forms of Earth testify to the two distinct environments. The glaciation dated 30 million years ago, and the intermittent glaciation since 3 million years ago, which can be blamed on electric plasma contacts by Saturn, follow the 27 million year repeating pattern. The rise of hominids in the last 3 million years is discussed. The last intermittent glaciations might testify to a series of recent interactions between Earth and Saturn. The mention in many creation myths of a period of darkness preceding creation can be dated to the early Neolithic or Upper Paleolithic and is likely the result of nanometer dust particles in the stratosphere after a massive compressive force and lightning strikes by Saturn in North America in 10,900 BC. Yeah, they were like five miles wide. That would be your shredded animals and trees from Earth and upheaval, wouldn't it? Massive strikes of mega lightning would tend to do that, wouldn't it? This caused the worldwide period of extreme cold, drought, and darkness, recognized today as the Younger Dryas period. For more on this, see the chapters Tunguska and Chicxulub, Let's see how close I got. Chicks and up. How about that? And the Younger Dryas. With additional Mesoamerican retellings in the chapters, the Chilambalum and the Papal Vu. The Cataclysm is addressed in papers by Richard Firestone in 2001, Mammoth Trumpet Magazine. And in 2007, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. You know, some guys, I don't, I'm not saying John Cook's one of them, but some folks think that if they pander to mainstream a little bit in their theory, that they'll get more accepted because they pandered a little bit. Like they're trying to get brownie points or something. I don't know. But sometimes it seems like some researchers try to do that, you know, to like give them some cred so that they'll give the researchers some cred. You know, I feel like certain people like Graham Hancock do that. It really irked me when Hancock started citing professors at Cambridge and Oxford for their research when his whole life he was supposed to be this renegade. Now, either he's, he's an academic and he's always been one, or he's pandering for votes, if you will. Now he wants to be recognized by mainstream, it seems. And that just isn't going to happen. But I think that a lot of his methods are a little unsound for an independent researcher. I mean, there is no way on earth that Hancock never heard of Velikovsky or didn't know of him. And for him to just shoo him away by saying, oh, well, he had some theories in the 50s. He was in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, all the way up until the day he died. So that's not right either. 
And since his main gist is man is a species with amnesia, I take exception with him. It shows me he's disingenuous. I think he sincerely believes this. Back to the reading before I start babbling. The cloud swirling skies, which are found at the start of most creation myths, are the result of Earth falling into a subpolar orbit with Saturn, then entering the lower part of the coma of Saturn. See the chapter, The Event of the Younger Dryas. For a narrative and consideration of the dynamics, this also coincided with the start of the hypothermal period. Let's see. Hypsothermal. Hypsothermal period. In 9500 BC, for which see the chapter A. Timeline. While traveling through the lower plasma formations of Saturn's coma, the Earth three times experienced the formation of three ball plasmoids, 150,000 to 400,000 miles, 240,000 to 644,000 miles, kilometers, sorry, below the South Pole. The lines of electrons connecting these and running past Earth to an object in the North skies. This started in 10,900 B.C. and ended in 8347 B.C. Now, where did those plasmoids come from, anyway? Did they just form? There was so much electricity in, the, in space that they just formed? Or did they come from a body? What I'm thinking is, is it's probably from Birkeland currents that are running along with the planets. That's probably what forms them. I look at them almost as a planet that failed, but it still has the charge of an entire planet. That's why these things are so monstrous. 10 to the 18th amps around that neighborhood. Got to write that down. That's definitely a question for Wall. The petroglyphs of this condition were investigated by a team led by Anthony Peratt and published in 2003 and 2007 in the IEEE Transactions on Plasma Science. The dates above are from my findings. The ubiquitous female figurines found in millions on millions worldwide, dating from the Upper Paleolithic and the Neolithic, are representations of Uranus, Neptune, Saturn, Mercury, and Mars, as seen together in the skies, on the ecliptic, enclosed in a coma, discussed in the chapter, A Timeline and Gimbutis. The one thing I like about Test's theory is the three, the three brown, the one red dwarf and two brown dwarfs coming in together. And really, no planet orbiting either star. It was almost just like they were floating there, you know? And you could see all three stars in the sky. I mean, that's just, that's something that really intrigues me. John has even speculated, and I think he will later in his story, that the Earth at one time had its own plasma sheath and had no star. It's coming, I think. I wouldn't be surprised if it comes down to the biggest body in the solar system getting the nod to be the star, because it draws the most electricity to it. The flood in 3147 BC is correctly identified in the mythology of Sumerian and Bible sources. Although shifted to a narrative of 2349 BC, it can be assumed that Jupiter, at that time closer to the sun, passed Saturn and its planets on the inside of Saturn's orbit. The current orbital inclinations of the outer planets matches the expected vertical separations of the planets in 3147 BC, discussed in Appendix B. Damn, I mean, how could you figure that out? How would you even know? I wish you would expand a little bit on the expected vertical separations. So what does that mean? Okay, vertical separations, that means not the horizontal, but the vertical, so the, whether they're above and below each other, right? Yes, of course. It means the planets, the polar configuration, vertical separation. I get it, okay. All right. I wish you expand on that. The palette of Narmer depicts Venus, Mars, and Uranus, where the pharaoh figure is Horus, Mars, and dressed as Saturn. Not some battle of unification for prehistoric Egypt. And with Mercury as the sandal bearer of the pharaoh. See Appendix the Palette of Narmer. I'm going to have to look that up and see what it is. Hmm. Palette of Narmer. I'm going to write that down. Let's copy and paste it. Find out what it is. Look it up. We'll call this show Stay in the Sky. Man, I'm going to get Marmer. Not even halfway through. Oh, my goodness. I lost my place. All right, uh... The cloud-swirling skies, which are found at the start of most creation myths, are the result of Earth falling into a subpolar orbit with Saturn, 
and entering the lower part of the coma of Saturn. See the chapter, The Event of the Younger Dryas, for a narrative and a consideration of the dynamics. This also coincided with the start of the Hypsothermal period, 9500 BC. All right, all right, all right, all right. Okay, I'm here. Okay. The bee and the sedge, as in he of the bee and the sedge, is the pharaoh as Saturn, with Venus as the bee, and Uranus as the sedge. See the chapters, the creation and the start of time. Hmm. I see. So this is kind of just a little tease for the expansion. You got to go read the chapter. Aha. Well, that makes total sense. Yeah. Because if I look these up and get a mainstream definition, it's not going to really mean much, is it? The creation and the start of time. Maybe I should write, read one of those. The raven and dove let out by Noah to test the waters can be identified as the planets Uranus and Venus. Well, he's mentioned Uranus a lot. As seen from Earth directly from 30 after 3147 BC. The Mesopotamian flood myths identify the same planets and adds a swallow, which is likely the moon, but might be the later Mercury. Well, that's, I mean, that, well, it's kind of taking a leap. I don't know. Well, it's better than literal, I suppose. Hmm. Very interesting. The report in the Bible and in Mesopotamian legends and hundreds of additional flood legends of a ship landing on a mountain after the flood is the backlit crescent of Jupiter on top of a massive outpouring of plasma from the south pole of Jupiter. In Egypt, as in some Mesopotamian retellings of this event, this is also understood as an approaching celestial bull which destroyed the city of the gods. The orbits of the inner planets have changed only minimal minimally, only minimally, since 3147 BC. Most changes involve an epicidal rotation of the second nodule point. Oh, gee, yeah, it happens all the time. I'll have to find out what the second nodule point is. Planets have to line up exactly with the sun to result in an electric field interaction of their plasma sphere. Okay. The biannual sightings of Mars passing close to Earth between 3070 BC and 2750 BC are recorded as events in the dynastic records of the Palermo Stone of Egypt. Take a look at the Palermo Stone. The few, I, the few interactions with Venus, which have been presented as collisions by others, occurred at distances of 10 to 12 million miles. 16 to 19 million kilometers, 17 to 20 million miles. Electric interactions with Mars occurred at much closer distances as Mars slipped by Earth and probably no closer than 40,000 miles. Details in various chapters in Appendix B. You know how lucky Earth is to be the third planet instead of the fourth? Man, because Mars could have easily been here. It must have a strong magnetic field or something, because they're supposed to be repelling each other, but I don't understand why the Sun would repel Mars further away than the Earth. The orbit of the Earth enlarged four times. All right, the orbit of the Earth enlarged four times since 3147 BC. In 2349 BC, 2193 BC, 1492 BC and 747 BC. See Appendix B, Celestial Mechanics. Each time the Earth reached a different location from the Sun, it needed to adjust its charge level and plumes of plasma extended up from the magnetic poles, perhaps lasting for years. Both the north and south plumes extending up some 10 to 20 Earth diameters were seen throughout the world. The ends moved with the rotation of the magnetosphere, making them look like they were waving in the wind. The people of Mesoamerica called them trees, with the birds sitting on top. Egypt called them braziers, releasing plumes of smoke in the Mesopotamia, and Mesopotamia called the east and west plume flags or banners, and recorded them in seals and sculpture. Mesoamerica, in two instances, provides a count of how many times this happened. The plumes were detected by NASA in a dark mode plasma in 2009, a year after I had added them to my text. Yeah, but those plumes don't have anything to do with the age of the Earth. When Jupiter entered the asteroid belt, the mountain form of the lower plasma disappeared. Instead of the plasma from Jupiter's south pole extended directly left and right to the asteroids and covered, curved up further away, Jupiter has a reversed magnetic field. These are the ram's horns of Amun-Ra. Amun -Ra. The form is called the Shin in Egypt, a circle on a flat line, and is depicted as a boat almost everywhere in antiquity. See chapter career of Jupiter. Jupiter's coma tripled in size 
in about 2527 BC as it left the asteroid belt, but lost its coma again by 2438 BC. The coma returned in 2349 BC, the flood of Noah, but eventually reduced to the visible size of the moon. In 2150 BC, Jupiter caught on fire and burned up a substantial amount of its atmosphere. When this extinguished, Jupiter reduced in size to that of a star. Huh? Jupiter reduced in size to that of a star? What was it before that? That's a little strange. Maybe it's a typo. I don't think a planet could be bigger than a star. Well, that'll do it for me today. I just wanted to get some of this to you. And I'm going to be back and I'll do some more reading later. All right, take care. The Bones. Chapter 4. The Birth of the Ice Age Theory. In 1836... Louis Agassiz, a young Swiss naturalist, went with Professor Jean Charpentier, another naturalist, to an alpine glacier to demonstrate to him the fallacy of the new idea that an ice sheet once covered a large part of Europe. Four years before, a teacher in a small town forestry school, A. Bernardi, had written, Once the polar ice reached as far as the southern limit of the district, which is still marked by erratics, a botanist had come upon the same idea, probably independently, and coined the term diizeite. He had succeeded in winning Charpentier to the hypothesis. At the edge of the glacier, Agiazzi, who came as a skeptic, was himself converted. He became the chief apostle of the new theory. He built a hut on the glacier of Ar and lived in it so that he could observe the movements of the ice and thereby attracted the attention of naturalists and curiosity seekers all over Europe. The study of the glaciers in the Alps revealed that the glacial ice may move by its own weight a few feet daily. It actually transports stones by carrying and pushing them. Okay, so it does do that too. Some are pushed by advancing front of the ice to form terminal moraines. When the glacier melts and retreats, the loose rocks remain where they were at the time of the greatest expansion of the glacier. Agiazzi assumed that the erratic boulders in the Jura Mountains had been carried there by ice from the Alps, and that the trains of boulders in northern Europe and America had been formed by gigantic glaciers that in the past covered large parts of these continents. He also concluded that the drift, the drift had been brought and left by the ice sheet. Ice scratched the underlying rock with the help of flint and other fragments of hard stone. It retained in its grasp and it polished the rocky floors and slopes and valleys and excavated the beds of lakes. Agiazzi made his conclusions with respect to the other parts of the world on the basis of observations limited to Switzerland and its surroundings. He thought that if he could convert Two of the leading geologists, Buckland, the author of Reliquive de Louvenet, and Murchison, to the Ice Age theory, and thus win their support. The task of gaining recognition for it would become much easier. Agiazzi went to the British Isles. In later years, as his widow described it, recalling the scientific isolation in which he stood, opposed as he was to all the prominent geologists of the day. He said, Among the older naturalists, only one stood by me, Dr. Buckland, Dean of Westminster. We went first to the highlands of Scotland, and it is one of the delightful recollections of my life that as we approached the castle of the Duke of Argyll, standing in a valley not unlike some of the Swiss valleys, I said to Buckland, Here we shall find our first traces of glaciers. And as the stage entered the valley, we actually drove over the ancient terminal moraine, which spanned the opening of the valley. It was a setting for a revelation. Agiazzi won a follower. 
A few weeks later, on November 4, 1840, Agiazzi read a paper before the Geological Society of London, summarizing the excursion in light of the Ice Age theory, and Buckland, who was then president of the Society, followed by a paper of his own on the same subject. Even before meeting, he had written to Agiazzi. Agiazzi of the success of his missionary work. Lyle has adapted your theory in total! Exclamation point on my showing him a beautiful cluster of moraines within two miles of his father's house. He instantly accepted it, as solving a host of difficulties that have all his life embarrassed him. Lyle, too, agreed to read a paper less than three weeks after this episode, on the day following the Agiazzi and Buckland lectures. In this paper hastily prepared, he explained, the moraines in Great Britain in the light of Agiazzi's teachings. At the November 4 meeting of the Society, Murchison attempted an opposition, but in the words of Agiazzi, did not produce much effect. He added, Dr. Buckland was truly eloquent. That same year, 1840, Agiazzi published his theory in a work entitled Estudes sur les glaciers, he wrote, I'm sorry if I butchered that. The surface of Europe previously adorned with tropical vegetation and populated by herds of huge elephants, enormous hippopotami, and gigantic carnivora, was suddenly buried under a vast mantle of ice, covering plains, lakes, seas, and plateaus, upon the life and movement of a vigorous creation fell the silence of death springs vanished rivers ceased flowing the rays of the sun rising up this frozen shore if indeed they reached it encountered only the breath of winter from the north and the thunder of the crevices as they opened up across the surface of this icy sea agiazzi regarded the inception and the termination of the Ice Age as catastrophic events. He believed that mammoths in Siberia were suddenly caught in the ice that spread swiftly over the larger part of the globe. He expressed the belief that repeated global catastrophes were accompanied by a fall in the temperature of the globe and its atmosphere, and that glacial ages, of which the Earth experienced more than one, were terminated each time by renewed igneous activity in the interior of the earth. Eruptions de interior. Thus he maintained that the Western Alps had risen up recently, at the end of the last ice age, and were younger than the carcasses of mammoths in Siberia, the flesh of which is still edible. These animals, he thought, had been killed at the beginning of the ice age. With the renewal of igneous activity, the ice cover melted, great floods ensued, and the mountains and lakes in Switzerland and in many other places were formed, and the relief map of the world was generally changed. Come on, man. It is often said that Agiazzi added from half a million to a million years to the recent history of the world by inserting the great ice age between the territory the territory, or the age of mammals, in the recent comprising the late Stone Age and historical times, it should be borne in mind, however, that the million-year span for the Ice Age is Lyle's estimate, and he interpreted Agiazzi's theory in the spirit of uniformity. The theory of a continental ice cover was acceptable to Lyle. He agreed to it, satisfied to go no farther. For his proof, then, two miles from his home. He realized that the floating icebergs could not explain the phenomenon of drift and erratic boulders in all places. The only alternative had been the waves of translation, or tidal waves, traveling on land, but this was outright catastrophic. Now, with the Continental Ice Age theory, he felt he had the correct solution if the catastrophic aspect of the theory, as originally suggested by Agiazzi, a follower of Cuvier, was eliminated. It was not yet asked what produced such a cover. 
End of subject error. Earth and Upheaval, Chapter 3, Uniformity, The Doctrine of Uniformity. For over 25 years, from the beginning of the French Revolution in 1789 to the Battle of Waterloo in 1815, Europe was in turmoil. France beheaded her king and queen. Many revolutionaries, in their turn, went to the scaffold too. Spain, Italy, Germany, Austria, and Russia became battlefields. The British Isles were in danger of being invaded, and Britain's fleet fought at Trafalgar, the tyrant who had sprung up from the Revolutionary Army. After 1815, there was a universal desire for peace and tranquility. The Holy Alliance was organized. Europe sank into reaction, England into a spirit of conservatism. The abortive revolutionary wave of 1830 did not reach the British Isles. I mean, they just keep the empire going. No wonder that in the climate of reaction to the eruptions of revolution and the, and, the, and, the, and the Napoleonic Wars, the theory of uniformity became popular and soon dominant in the natural sciences. According to this theory, the development of the surface of the globe has been going on through all the ages without any disturbances. The process of very slow change that we observe at present has been the only process of importance from the beginning. This theory, first advanced by Hutton, 1795, and Lamarck, 1800, was elevated to its present position as a scientific law by Charles Lyell, a young attorney whose interest in geology was to make him the most influential person in that field, and by Lyell's disciple and friend, Charles Darwin. Darwin built his theory of evolution on Lyell's principle of uniformity. I'm sorry, Lyell's principle of uniformity. A modern exponent of the theory of evolution, H.F. Osborne wrote, Present continuity implies the improbability of past catastrophism and violence of change, either in the lifeless or in the living world. Moreover, we seek to interpret the changes and laws of past time through those which we deserve at the present time. This was Darwin's secret, learned from Lyle. Lyle built his case with convincing dialectics, wind and solar heat and rain. Little by little, crumble the rock in the highlands. Rivers carry the detritus to the sea. The land is lowered by this process, which continues for ages. It's kind of like a cow, just standing there eating grass. Chewing his cud. Until it churns a vast region into detritus. detritus. Then the mass of earth, as if in a slow breathing process, every phase of which requires eons, again slowly rises. The bottom of the sea subsides and the crumbling of, of the rock begins all over again. The land comes up in the elevated plateau. The subsequent action of water and wind cuts furrows. And little by little, the highland changes into a range of mountain peaks. Like that little tiny Colorado River carved that immense Grand Canyon, but it had some kind of magic way to get rid of all the residue, because there is no residue. You can't find it anywhere. The reason why you can't is because it was blasted into outer space from thunderbolts by a close planet. I, just, I, I always just get so amazed that people actually believe that that river, that little river, carved that big canyon. There's one very important fact, well, two very important facts that we can't lose sight of. And that is, the Earth and Saturn are spot-on matches with their oxygen, their water, and the salt. That cannot be ignored. Okay, I'll stop. I just wanted to have that say. Highland changes into a range of mountains, peaks. More eons in those heights crumble too. Wind and rain carrying the grain, them grain by grain, into the sea. The shallow sea encroaches on the land, then slowly retreats. No great catastrophes intervene to change the face of the earth. Although sporadic volcanic action occurs, Lyle did not consider it to have an effect in changing the face of the earth comparable in importance to that of rivers, wind, and waves of the sea. 
What causes the eon-long process of elevation and subsidence has not been determined. Naturalists of the 18th century claim to have observed a minute gradual change in the level of the Gulf of Bothnia in the Baltic Sea. In relation to the coastline, similar processes in past geological ages must have brought about all the changes on the Earth. They found uh, pre-flood relics. Similar processes in the past geological ages must have brought about all the changes on the Earth. The majestic mountains that rose and others that were level. The sea coast that in a slow rhythm back and forth and the earth mantle that was redistributed by rain and wind. According to the theory of uniformity, no process took place in the past that is not taking place in the present. And not only the nature, but also the intensity of physical phenomena of our age are the criteria of what could have happened in the past. Since the theory of uniformity is still taught in all places of learning, and to question it is heresy, it is pertinent to reproduce here some of Lyell's original statements made in his Principles of Geology. They served as a manifesto or credo for all his followers. Whether called uniformists or evolutionists, Lyell wrote, It has been truly observed that when we arrange the known phosphorus formations in chronological order, they constitute a broken and effective series. We pass without any intermediate gradations from the systems of strata which are horizontal to other systems which are highly inclined, from rocks of peculiar mineral composition to others which have a character wholly distinct from the assemblage of organic remains to another, in which frequently nearly all the species and a large part of the genera are different. These violations of continuity are so common as to constitute in most regions the rule rather than the exception, and they have been considered by many geologists as conclusive in favor of sudden revolutions in the inanimate and animate world. Thus he acknowledged that the surface of the globe has the appearance of having been subjected to great and violent sudden changes, but he believed that the record is incomplete and that the major part of the evidence is lost. In the solid framework of the globe, we have a chronological chain of natural records, many links of which are wanting. To make this plausible, Lyle cited every year in 60 provinces, changes in the population would appear to be very gradual. But if the census were taken every year in a different province, and in only one, the change in the population of each province between the visits of the census takers at 60-year intervals would be very great. Lyell maintained that this was the way geological deposits were made. The theory of uniformity or of gradual changes in the past measured by the extent of changes observed in the present has, as Lyell admitted, no positive evidence in the incomplete record of the Earth's crust. Consequently, the theory, building on argumentum ex silentio, or argument by default, required further analogies. Suppose we have discovered two buried cities at the foot of Vesuvius. Immediately superimposed upon each other, with a great mass of tuft and lava intervening, an antiquary archaeologist might possibly be entitled to infer from the inscriptions on public edifices that the inhabitants of the inferior and older city were Greeks, and those of the modern town Italians. But he would reason very hastily, if he also concluded from these data, that there had been a sudden change from the Greek to the Italian language in Campania. But if he afterwards found three buried cities, one above the other, the intermediate one being Roman, he would then perceive the fallacy of his former opinion, and would begin to suspect that the catastrophes by which the cities were inhumed might have no relation whatever the fluctuations in the language of the inhabitants, and that, as the Roman tongue had evidently intervened between the Greek and Italian. So many other dialects may have been spoken in succession, and the passage from Greek to the Italian may have been 
very gradual. This often reprinted passage is an unfortunate example, for in order to prove that there had been no violent changes, Lyle chose to present a picture of violent catastrophes. The strata are separated by layers of lava. This is also the picture presented in so many geological surveys. To use this example as a proof of uniformity is a flight of dialectics. The comparison is followed by an accusation that it is all the more vigorous because of the inadequacy of the example which is called on to substitute for geological evidence, Lyle said. It appeared clear that the earlier geologist had not only a scanty acquaintance with existing changes caused by wind, flowing water, etc., but were singularly unconscious of the amount of their ignorance. They didn't know what they didn't know. With the presumption naturally inspired by this unconsciousness, they had no hesitation in deciding at once that time could never enable the existing powers of nature to work out changes of great magnitude. Still less such important revolutions as those which are brought to light by geology, and he proceeded, never was there a dogma more calculated to foster indolence and to blunt the edge of curiosity than this assumption of the discordance between the ancient and existing causes of change. It produced a state of mind unfavorable in the highest degree to the candid reception of the evidence of those minute but incessant alterations which every part of the earth's surface is undergoing. At first the tone of this pleading for the then unorthodox theory of uniformity was defensive. Position was unsupported by sufficient evidence. Then, as though a few analogies to human situations were so strong that they could substitute for the defective record of nature. The tone changed and became uncompromising. Isn't that always the case? They're always humble at first. For this reason, all theories are rejected, which involve the assumption of sudden and violent catastrophes and revolutions of the whole earth and its inhabitants. Theories which are restrained by no reference to existing analogies, and in which a desire is manifested to cut, rather than patiently to untie the Gordian knot. Notwithstanding the strong language employed, the scientific principle which insists that whatever does not occur at the present time has not occurred in the past. I mean, that's just ridiculous on the face of it. A self-imposed limitation. Rather than a principle in science, it is a statute of faith. And Lyle ended his famous chapter accordingly, with an appeal for faith and with a precept for believers. If he, the student, finally believes in the resemblance or identity of the ancient and present systems of terrestrial changes, he will regard every fact collected, respected the causes in diurnal action, as afforded him a key to the interpretation of some mystery in the past. End of subchapter. The hippopotamus inhabits the larger rivers and marshes of Africa. It is not found in Europe or America, save in zoological gardens where specimens of it wallow most of the time in pools, submerging their huge bodies in the muddy water with that tooth. Next to the elephant, it is the largest of the land animals. Bones of hippopotami are found in the soil of Europe, as far north as Yorkshire in England. Lyle gave the following explanation for the presence for the hippopotamus in Europe. The geologist may freely speculate on the time when herds of hippopotami issued from North African rivers, such as the Nile, and swam northward in summer along the coasts of the Mediterranean, and even occasionally visited the islands near the shore. Here and there they may have landed to graze or browse, tarrying a while, and afterwards continuing their course northward. Others may have swum in a few summer days from rivers in the south of Spain or France to the Somme, Thames, or Severn, river in Wales in England, making timely retreat to the south before the snow and ice set in. An article from the rivers of Africa to the Isles of Albion 
sounds like an idol. In the Victorian cave near Settle in West Yorkshire, 1,450 feet above sea level, under 12 feet of clay deposit containing some well-scratched boulders, were found numerous remains of the mammoth, rhinoceros, hippopotamus, bison, hyena, and other animals. In northern Wales, in the Vale of Clod, in numerous caves, remains of the hippopotamus lay together with those of the mammoth, the rhinoceros, and the cave lion. In the cave of K. Gwyn, in the Vale of Clod, during the excavations it became clear that the bones had been greatly disturbed by water action. The floor of the cavern was covered afterwards by clays and sand containing foreign pebbles. This seemed to prove that the caverns, now 400 feet above sea level, must have been submerged subsequently to their occupation by the animals and by man. The contents of the cavern must have been dispersed by marine action during the great submergence in mid-glacial times, and afterwards covered by marine sands, writes H. B. Woodward. Hippopotami not only traveled during the summer nights to England and Wales, but also climbed hills to die peacefully among other animals in the caves and the ice. Approaching softly, tenderly spread little pebbles over the travelers resting in peace. And the land, with its hills and caverns, in a slow lullaby movement, sank below the level of the sea, and gentle streams caressed the dead bodies and covered them with rosy sand. Three assumptions were made by the exponents of uniformity. Sometime not long ago, the climate of the British Isles was so warm that hippopotami used to visit there in summer. The British Isles subsided so much that caves in the hills became submerged. The land rose again to its present height, and all this without any action of a violent nature. Or it was, perchance, a mountain-high wave that crossed the land and poured into caves and filled them with marine sand and gravel? Or did the ground submerge and then emerge again in some paroxysm of nature in which the climate also changed? Did the animals run away at the sign of the approaching catastrophe? And did the trespassing sea follow and suffocate them in the caves that were their last refuge and became the place of their burial? Or did the sea sweep them from Africa, throw them in heaps on the British Isles and in other places, and cover them with earth and marine debris? The entrances to some caves were too narrow, and the caves themselves too shrunk, contracted, to have been places of refuge for such huge animals as hippopotami and rhinoceroses, which ever of these answers or surmises is correct, and whether the hippopotami lived in England or were thrown there by the ocean, whether they sought refuge in caves, or the caves are but graves, their bones on the British Isles, as also on the bottom of the seas surrounding these islands, are signs of some great natural change. End of subject. Icebergs The theory that rejected the occurrence of catastrophic events in the past is incompatible with the then prevailing teaching, which ascribed to the distribution of drift, the deposit of rock debris, clay and organic material that covers continental areas, and of erratic boulders to the action of water, in the form of great tidal waves, breaking upon the continents, a slow moving source, able to do the same work but in a longer time, had to be found. Lyell assumed that icebergs transferred rocks over the expanse of the sea. Icebergs are broken off parts of glaciers that descend from the mountainous coasts to the sea. Mariners in northern waters have observed icebergs with pieces of rock attached to them. And if we think of the enormity of the past geological epochs and multiply the action of icebergs as carriers of earth and rocks by the time elapsed, we may explain, so argued Lyle, 
the presence of erratic boulders, as well as of till and gravel on land. Erratic boulders are found far from the seashore. Lyle taught that the land was submerged and icebergs traveling over it dropped their load of stones. Later, the land emerged with the stones on it. Erratic boulders are found on mountains. Therefore, these mountains were under shallow water when icebergs, carrying stones from other regions, dropped them on the summits. In order to explain in this manner the provenance of erratic boulders, it was necessary to submerge large parts of continents in rather recent times. In some places, erratic boulders are distributed in a long string, as in the Berkshires. Icebergs could not have acted as intelligent carriers, and Lyle must have felt the weakness of his theory on this point. The only alternative known at that time was that of a tidal wave, but Lyle abhorred catastrophes. He detested them, alike the political life of Europe and in nature. Characteristically, his autobiography begins with this description of the most vivid memory of his earliest childhood. I was four and a half, and when an event happened which was not likely to be forgotten, his family traveled in two carriages, a stage and a half, Edinburgh, on the narrow road with a steep bra above and an equally precipitous one below, and no apparent on the roadside, a flock of sheep jumped down into the road and frightened the horses of the other carriage. Away they ran, and with the chase, man, horses, and all, disappeared clean out of sight, over the bra in an instant. There was a rescue through the broken pane of glass. A little blood ran, and somebody fainted. It left the first and strongest impression of his childhood in the memory of the author of The Theory of Uniformity. Oh, so it was a catastrophe. So his greatest memory was that of a catastrophe. That's kind of ironic, isn't it? I get it. Is it the way it was, the way he worded it was a little confusing. Leave it to a shrink like Dr. Velikovsky to figure that out. That's pretty good. Darwin in South America. Yeah, I've read this before, I believe. Charles Darwin who had previously dropped his medical studies at Edinburgh University, upon his graduation in theology from Christ College, Cambridge, who would have thought, went in December 1831 as a naturalist on the ship Beagle, which sailed around the world on a five-year surveying expedition. Darwin had with him the newly published volume of Lyle's Principles of Geology. That became his Bible. On his voyage, he wrote in his journal, the second edition of which he dedicated to Lyle, this round-the-world voyage was Darwin's only fieldwork, experience in geology and paleontology. And he drew on it all his lifelong. He wrote later that these observations served as the origin of all my views. His observations in the Southern Hemisphere and more particularly in South America, America, a continent that had attracted the attention of naturalists since the exploration travels of Alexander von Humboldt, 1799-1804, Darwin was impressed by the numerous assemblages of fossils of extinct animals, mostly of much greater size than species now living. These fossils spoke of a flourishing fauna that suddenly came to its end, in a recent geological age. He wrote under January 9, 1834, in the journal of his voyage, It is impossible to reflect on the changed state of the American continent without the deepest astonishment. Formerly, it must have swarmed with great monsters. Now we find mere pygmies compared with the antecedent allied races. He proceeded thus, the greater number, if not all, of this extinct quadruped lived at a late period and were the contemporaries of most of the existing seashells, since they lived no very great change in the form of the land can have taken place. What then has exterminated so many species and whole genera? The mind at first is irresistibly hurried into the belief of some great catastrophe, but thus to destroy animals, both large and small in southern Patagonia, in Brazil, on the Cordillera of Peru, in North America, up to Bering Straits, 
he must shake the entire framework of the globe. No lesser physical event could have brought about this wholesale destruction, not only in the Americas, but in the entire world. And such an event being beyond consideration, Darwin did not know the answer. But it could hardly have been a change of temperature, which at about the same time destroyed the inhabitants of tropical, temperate, and arctic latitudes on both sides of the globe. Certainly it could not have been man in the role of destroyer, and were he to attack all large animals, would he also be the cause of extinction of the many fossil mice and other small quadrupeds? Darwin asked. No one will imagine that a drought could destroy every individual of every species from southern Patagonia to the Bering Straits. What shall we say of the extinction of the horse? Did those plains fail of pasture, which have since been overrun by thousands and hundreds of thousands of the descendants of the stock introduced by the Spaniards? Uh, of the descendants of the stock introduced by the Spaniards. Hmm. Darwin concluded, certainly no fact in a long history of the world is so startling as the wide and repeated exterminations of its inhabitants. Out of Darwin's embarrassment grew the idea of the extinction of species as a prelude to natural selection. In this you End of chapter. The East India Company was signing Darwin's paychecks. Earth and Upheaval is a book about the great tribulations to which the planet on which we travel was subjected in prehistorical and historical times. The pages of this book are transcripts of the testimony of mute witnesses, the rocks, in the court of celestial traffic. They testify by their own appearance and by the encased contents of dead bodies, fossilized skeletons, myriads upon myriads of living creatures came to life on this ball of rock, suspended in nothing, and returned to dust. Many died a natural death. Many were killed in wars between races and species, and many were entombed alive during the great paroxysms of nature in which land and sea contested in destruction. Whole tribes of fish that had filled the oceans suddenly ceased to exist. Of entire species and even genera of land animals, not a single survivor was left. The earth and the water, without which we cannot exist, suddenly turned into enemies and engulfed the animal kingdom, the human race included. And there was no shelter and no refuge. In such cataclysms, the land and the sea repeatedly changed places, laying dry the kingdom of the ocean and submerging the kingdoms of the land. Our in Worlds in Collision, I presented the Chronicles of two, the very last series of such catastrophes, those that visited our Earth in the second and first millennia before the present era. Since these upheavals occurred in historical times, when the art of writing had already been perfected in the centers of ancient civilization, I described them mainly from historical documents, relying on celestial charts, calendars, and sundials and water clocks, discovered by archaeologists, and drawing also upon classical literature, the sacred literature of East and West, the epics of the northern races, and the oral traditions of the primitive peoples from Lapland to the South Seas, geological vestiges of the events narrated in documents and traditions were indicated only here and there. When I felt that the immediate testimony of the rocks must be presented along with the historical evidence. I close that description of cataclysmic events with a promise to attempt, at a later date, the reconstruction of similar global catastrophes of earlier times, one of them being the deluge. I had intended, after piecing together the history of these upheavals, 
to present geological and paleontological material to support the testimony of man. But the reception of worlds in collision by certain scientific groups persuaded me before reviving the pageant of earlier catastrophes. To present, at least, some of the evidence of the rocks, which is as insistent as that carried down to our times by written records. Do they know of the days, recent and ancient, when the harmony of this world was interrupted by the forces of nature? Have they entombed innumerable creatures and encased them in rock? Have they seen the ocean moving on continents and the continents sliding under water? Was this earth and the expanse of its seas showered with stones and covered by ashes? Were its forests uprooted by hurricanes and set afire, covered by tides carrying sand and debris from the bottom of the ocean? It takes millions of years for a log to be turned into coal, but only a single hour when burning. Here lies the core of the problem. Did the earth change in a slow process, a year added to a year and a million to a million the peaceful ground of nature being the broad arena of the contest of throngs in which the fittest survive? Or did it happen, too, that the very arena itself, infuriated, rose against the contestants and made an end of their battles? I present here some pages from the Book of Nature. I have excluded from them all references to ancient literature, traditions, and folklore, and this I have done with intent so that careless critics cannot decry the entire work as tales and legends. Stones and bones are the only witnesses, mute as they are. They will testify clearly and unequivocally, yet dull ears and dimmed eyes will deny this evidence, and the dimmer the vision, the louder and more insistent will be the voices, voices of protestation. This book was not written for those who swear by the verba magistry, the holiness of their school wisdom, and they may debate it without reading it as well. Author's Note In the body of earth and upheaval, I found nothing demanding revocation, or change from the original edition of November 1955. Since then, it has been reprinted unchanged many times. Books just, I don't I think they're still being, I don't know if they're out of print yet, but his books have always been successful. The uncompromising stand of the followers of uniformitarian dogma, whether called gradualists, evolutionists, or Darwinists, or big bangers, they're all three in cahoots with the Royal Society, maintaining that nothing of radical change in nature has taken place in the past because nothing like it is observable at present. A view without logic, imagination, or basis in fact began to show signs of fracturing, pressing deeper cracks, and an ultimate collapse, the term cataclysmic evolution, entered scientific literature. The term new catastrophism was offered to let it appear that the new tenets differ from Velikovsky's views, and a minor key was struck repeatedly, even in recognizing the interference of elementary forces in the course of history. Thus, the great global disturbances of the 15th or 8th century before the present era were made to appear as the result of an explosion of a single volcano, Thera, in an Aegean Sea, in the Aegean Sea. Yet, in some instances, like the discovery of the great submarine ridge encompassing the globe almost twice, the discoverer felt compelled to exclaim in print, the discovery at the this late date of the mid-ocean ridge and rift has raised fundamental questions about basic geological processes and the history of the earth, and has even had reverberations in cosmology. And his discovery of the whitish ash underlying the beds of all the oceans and seas, the so-called Warzel Ash, J. L. Warzel was to led to exclaim in print, it may be necessary to attribute the layer to a worldwide volcanism, or perhaps to the fiery end of bodies of cosmic origin. And then occasionally I was confronted with entire faculties of geophysicists, as in Madison, Wisconsin, in 1967. 
who would claim that all signs of catastrophes resulted but from local events. I would prefer to the findings of Hazin or Warzel, or ask what local event could change the level of all oceans 34 centuries ago, as realized by R. Daly of Harvard in 1930, and confirmed by P. Kuchnin, 1959, or change the climate all over the world, both 34 and 27 centuries ago. As clearly as the 1960s, I found that earth and upheaval was displacing the origin of species in the courses of a number of geophysics. As in the case of my visit to Oberlin College in 1965 at Princeton University, earth and upheaval from its publication and for two decades was required reading in the paleontology course of Professor Glenn Jesper. Jepson, H. H. Hess, chairman of the Department of Geology, later Geophysics, told me that he knew earth and upheaval by heart. He debated it with me. At the first open meeting of Cosmos and Kronos, which he founded on the campus of Princeton University in January 1965 for study and discussion of my work, such groups sprang up on other campuses too. Today, the groups studying in the physical and geophysical fields find a center in cosmos and chronos, physical sciences. I said I said I would not revoke anything from the original, it's hard to make that word out, there, that's a little better, edition of 1955. However, to one section, I would like to make some pertinent remarks. By the 1950s, the hypothesis, 1920, of A. Wagner about drifting continents gained an acceptance for the advancement of science. A roll call showed equal numbers of supporters and opponents. In the later 60s, the trend took a dramatic turn. The ever unsatisfactory part of the hypothesis, the nature of the force that causes the continents to drift, an unequal attraction of the moon on various latitudes, Wagoner, and periodical radioactive heating of the interior of the earth, Dutoit was tackled anew, and in some unintended way I had a part in it. Here is the story. The form address before the graduate form of Princeton University, printed as a supplement at the end of this book, was read on October 14, 1953. In it, I claim that Jupiter, being a charged body, emits radio signals, and that Earth, being a charged body, possesses a magnetosphere and further that this magnetosphere reaches all the way to the lunar orbit. All three claims were subsequently confirmed under dramatic circumstances and mark epochal detections. But Hess had his say. A number of times following the publication of Earth and Upheaval, late in 1955, Hess invited me to speak to an audience of the professors and graduate students of his department. My position on continental drift was, and is, intermediary between that of those who reject his concept, H. Jeffries, the leading British geophysicist, geophysicist, and V. V. Belisov the leading Russian geophysicist, never ceased to be its most outspoken opponents, never ceased to be its most outspoken opponents, and those who support the idea. I would therefore not recognize the outline of the present continents as everlasting features, only extended by the drift of continents. The moving force was there by inertia, and the displacement of the strata could continue at an ever-diminishing rate for centuries. The volcanic activity and earthquakes I described resulting from these very occurrences and decreasing with time. Once a professor from the University of Rhodesia came to a lecture at the same auditorium where I usually offered my challenge and told that this expedition found the magnetic remnant intensity of lavas in Somalia and Ethiopia, a thousandfold stronger than the terrestrial magnetic field, half a Gauss, could invest in these lavas when cooling below the Pierre Curie point. Further, he described that in Arabia, 
the magnetic remnant direction was found reversed from that of neighboring Somalia and Ethiopia on the African coast. Once more, I tease the audience. You have to turn around Arabia in relation to Africa. If you wish to explain the phenomenon by continental drift and the thousand-fold strong magnetic remnants, you cannot explain even by rotating Arabia. One day, Hesh showed me a design he was making of loops of magma traveling from the molten interior of the earth toward the crust, toward its crust. He wished to hear my opinion on such loops. As a source of energy for moving continents, I did not show appreciation of such loops, entirely hypothetical, actually figments of an imagination. For a while I did not know that Harry, we started to call each other by our given names, made his theory known. I knew of enthusiastic supporters of plate tectonics, like J. Tuzo Wilson of Toronto, but only from Walter Sullivan's Continents in Moulton, 1974, did I learn that Hess was the originator of the idea, and then I remembered these incidents. Paul Wesson of Cambridge University collected from scientific literature over 70 arguments against plate tectonics in drifting continents. I remain unswayed either by the enthusiasts or by their opponents. Only by learning what happened to the earth less than 4,000 years ago, of which we have an inexhaustible store of human testimony a little of which is collected in Worlds in Collision, and another store of unexplained, but carry its own explanation, scenery, from all latitudes and longitudes, may we arrive at the understanding which so many are still afraid to face. Chapter 1 In the North In Alaska, to the north of Mount McKinley, the tallest mountain in North America, the Tanana River joins the Yukon. From the Tanana Valley, and the valleys of its tributaries. Gold is mined out of gravel and muck. This muck is a frozen mass of animals and trees. F. Rainey of the University of Alaska described the scene. Wide cuts, often several miles in length and sometimes as much as 140 feet in depth, are now being sliced out along stream valleys tributary to the Tanana in the Fairbanks district in order to reach gold-bearing gravel beds. An overburden of frozen silt or muck is removed with hydraulic giants. This muck contains enormous numbers of frozen bones of extinct animals, such as the mammoth, mastodon, super bison, and horse. These animals perished in rather recent times. Present estimates place their extinction at the end of the Ice Age, or in early post-glacial times. The soil of Alaska covered their bodies together with those of animals of species still surviving. Under what conditions did this great slaughter take place, in which millions upon millions of animals were torn limb from limb and mangled up with uprooted trees? F. C. Hibben of the University of New Mexico writes, Although the formation of deposits of muck is not clear, there is ample evidence that at least portions of this material were deposited under catastrophic conditions. Mammal remains, for the most part, dismembered and disarticulated, even though some fragments yet remain in their frozen state. Portions of ligaments, skin, hair, and flesh, twisted and torn trees, are piled in splintered masses. At least four considerable layers of volcanic ash may be traced in these deposits, although they are extremely warped and distorted. Could it be that a volcanic eruption killed the animal population of Alaska? The streams carrying down into the valleys, the bodies of slaughtered animals, a volcanic eruption would have charred the trees, but would not have uprooted and splintered them. If it killed animals, it would not have dismembered them. The presence of volcanic ash indicates that a volcanic eruption did take place, and repeatedly, in four consecutive stages of the same epoch. Mainstream theory regards the cause of such granulation to originate from convection columns splintered only by a stupendous wave that lifted and carried and smashed and tore 
and buried millions of bodies in millions of trees. Well, that's pretty good. Also, the area of the catastrophe was much greater than the action of a few volcanoes that could have covered, than a few volcanoes could have covered. Muck deposits like those of the Tanana River Valley are found in lower reaches of the Yukon in the western part of the peninsula, on the Koyukuk River that flows into the Yukon from the north, on the Kuskokum River that empties its waters into Bering Sea. At several places along the Arctic coast, and so may be considered to extend in greater or lesser thickness over all unglaciated areas of the northern peninsula. What could have caused the Arctic Sea and the Pacific Ocean to erupt and wash away forests with all their animal population and throw the entire mingled mass in great heaps scattered all over Alaska? The coast of which is longer than the Atlantic seaboard, from Newfoundland to Florida. Was it not a tectonic revolution in the Earth's crust that also caused the volcanoes to erupt and to cover the peninsula with ashes? In various levels of the muck, stone artifacts were found frozen in the situ at great depths and in apparent association with the ice age fauna which implies that men were contemporary with extinct animals in alaska worked flints characteristically shaped called yuma points were repeatedly found in the alaskan muck 100 and more feet below the surface one such spear point was found there between a lion's jaw and a mammoth's tusk Similar weapons were used only a few generations ago by the Indians of the Athapaskan tribe who camped in the upper Tanana Valley. It has also been suggested that even modern Eskimo points are remarkably human-like, all of which indicates that the multitudes of torn animals and splintered forests date from a time not many thousand years ago. The Ivory Islands the Arctic coast of Siberia is cold, bleak, inhospitable. The sea is passable for ships maneuvering between floating ice for two months of the year. From September to the middle of July, the ocean north of Siberia is fettered, an unbroken desert of ice. Polar winds sweep over frozen tundras of Siberia, where no tree grows and the soil is never tilled. In this exploratory voyage of the ship Vega, in 1878, Nils Adolf Erik Nordenskold, the first to traverse this northern seaway from one end to the other, traveled for weeks along the coast from Zemelia, Nova Novolia Zemelia, to Cape Shelegskoy, 170 degrees 30 east on the eastern extremity of Siberia without seeing a single human being on the shore. Fossil tusk of the mammoth, an extinct elephant, were found in northern Siberia and brought southward to markets at a very early time, possibly in the days of Pliny, in the first century of the present era. The Chinese excelled in working delicate designs in the ivory, much of which they obtained from the north, and from the days of the conquest of Siberia, 1582, by the Cossack Yermak from Ivan the Terrible until our own times. Trade in mammoth tusk has gone on. Northern Siberia provided more than half the world's supply of ivory, many piano keys and many billiard balls being made from the fossil tusks of these mammoths. In 1797, I mean, there just must have been just millions of them. In 1797, a body of a mammoth with flesh, skin, and hair was found in northeastern Siberia. And since then, bodies of other mammoths have been unearthed from the frozen ground in various parts of that region. The flesh had the appearance of freshly frozen beef. It was edible, and wolves and sled dogs fed on it without harm. The ground must have been frozen ever since the day of their entombment. Had it not been frozen, the bodies of the mammoths would have putrefied in a single summer but they remained unspoiled for some thousands of years. It is therefore absolutely necessary to believe 
that the bodies were frozen up immediately after the animals died and were never once thought until the day of their discovery. High in the north above Siberia, 600 miles inside the polar circle, in the Arctic Ocean lie the Lyakov Islands. Lyakov was a hunter who, in the days of Catherine II, ventured to these islands and brought back the report that they abounded in mammoth's bones. Such was the enormous quantity of mammoth's remains that it seemed that the island was actually composed of the bones and tusks of elephants, cemented together by icy sand. The New Siberian Islands, discovered in 1805 and 1806, as well as the islands of Stolbovoy and Belkov to the west, present the same picture. The soil of these desolate islands is absolutely packed full of bones of elephants and rhinoceroses in astonishing numbers. The Ivory Islands These islands were full of mammoth bones and the quantity of tusks and teeth of elephants and rhinoceroses found in the newly discovered island of New Siberia was perfectly amazing and surpassed anything which had as of yet been discovered. Did the animals come there over the ice? And for what purpose? On what food could they have lived? Not on the lichens of the Siberian tundras, covered by deep snow most of the year, and still less on the moss of the polar islands, which were frozen ten months in the year. Mammoths, members of the voracious elephant family, required huge quantities of vegetable food every day in the year. How could large herds of them have existed in a country like northeast Siberia, which is regarded as the coldest place in the world and where there was no food for them. You'd think the mainstreamers would at least have asked themselves that question. It's almost like they don't want to know. Mammoth tusks have been dredged in nets from the bottom of the Arctic Ocean, and after Arctic gales, the shores of the islands are strewn with tusks cast up by the billows. This is regarded as an indication that the bottom of the Arctic Ocean between the islands and the mainland was dry land in the days when mammoths roamed there. George Cuvier, the great French paleontologist, 769-1832, thought that in a vast catastrophe of continental dimensions, the sea overwhelmed the land. The herds of mammoths perished, and in a second spasmodic movement, the sea rushed away, leaving the carcasses behind. This catastrophe must have been accompanied by a precipitous drop in temperature. The frost seized the dead bodies and saved them from decomposition. In some mammoths, when discovered, even the eyeballs were still preserved. Charles Darwin, who denied the occurrence of continental catastrophes in the past, in a letter to Sir Henry Howarth, admitted that the extinction of mammoths in Siberia was for him an insoluble problem. J. D. Dana, the leading American geologist of the second half of the last century, wrote, "The encasing in ice of huge elephants and the perfect and the perfect preservation of flesh." shows that the cold finally became suddenly extreme, and as of a single winter's night, and knew no relenting afterward. In the stomachs and in between the teeth of the mammoths were found plants and grasses that do not grow now in northern Siberia. The contents of the stomachs have been carefully examined. They showed the undigested food, leaves of trees, now found in southern Siberia, but a long way from the existing deposits of ivory. Microscopic examination of the skin showed red blood corpuscles, which was a proof not only of a sudden death, but that the death was due to suffocation, either by gases or water. Eventually, the latter in this case. But the puzzle remained to account for the sudden freezing up of this large mass of flesh so as to preserve it for future ages. 
What could have caused the sudden change in the temperature? Today, the country does not provide food for large quadrupeds. The soil is barren and produces only moss and fungi a few months in the year. At that time, the animals fed on plants. And not only mammoths pastured in northern Siberia and on the islands of the Arctic Ocean. On Kotelnoi Island, neither trees nor shrubs nor bushes exist. And yet the bones of elephants, rhinoceroses, buffaloes, and horses are found in the icy wilderness in numbers which defy all calculation. NASA announces Dragonfly drone mission to Titan. The dual quadcopter drone will make dozens of flights across Saturn's largest moon, studying its chemistry and looking for signs of past and present life. Hopefully it won't get shot down. <laughs> Dragonfly, with its eight rotors, will explore Saturn's moons Titan by flight, first for an off-world mission. Today, NASA announced the next mission in their New Frontiers program to explore the solar system. Dragonfly, a drone lander, will explore Saturn's largest moon, Titan. Today, NASA announced the next mission in their New Frontiers program to explore the solar system, Dragonfly. A drone leader will explore Saturn's largest moon, Titan. Titan is the only solar system moon with an extensive atmosphere and standing bodies of liquid on its surface. The moon is also filled with organic materials and is thought to be similar to what early Earth might have looked like before life formed, but with many of the same ingredients. Despite being a distant moon, it often ranks as one of the most Earth-like worlds in the solar system. Dragonfly, which will launch in 2026 and land on Titan in 2034, let's see, I'll be, I don't think about it is being managed by Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. It will be able to make multiple autonomous flights, up to a few dozen, powered by its rotors across Titan's surface. Then it'll just be trashed. In total, it will spend about two and a half years exploring Titan's geology and chemistry. This includes flying over 100 miles and searching for the possibility of life in the past or even in the present day. They can make this little flight copter last for two and a half years on Titan, but they can't make a car battery that goes over 45 miles an hour and lasts longer than 12 hours. I don't know. Go figure. <laughs> the spacecraft. Dragonfly weighs nearly a thousand pounds and is roughly the size of a dune buggy. A thousand pound vehicle flying around in its atmosphere. <laughs> Well, I think that the atmosphere is a lot thicker there. Let's read. Thanks to the, the thick cover of Titan's atmosphere, well, there you go, and its distance from the sun, Dragonfly can't rely on solar power and will instead carry a multiple mission radioisotope thermoelectric generator, MMRTG. Ah, a nuclear power source like the one the Curiosity rover uses on Mars. Dragonfly will carry multiple cameras to take pictures on its journey, both from a distance and up close when it lands, to get a zoomed-in image of material it studies. It also carries a mass spectrometer, allowing it to analyze in detail the materials it encounters across Titan's surface and determine their chemical makeup. It can perform meteorological studies as it cruises Titan's atmosphere in seismic studies to examine Titan's underground. The drone will first land in Titan's sand dunes near the equatorial region. It has no wheels, but it can make short hops of only a few feet if it spies something interesting nearby but it's also designed to fly up to eight or nine miles at a time. Thousand pounds, pretty impressive. Traveling long distances to explore many different areas of Titan. Its eventual goal is Selk Crater. Researchers are especially interested in, its, in this impact crater because of the combination of past liquid water, organic materials, and energy. These are seen as the three crucial ingredients for life. Kurt Nebar, 
Kurt Niebuhr. Kurt Niebuhr, the leading program scientist for NASA's New Frontiers program, explained during the press conference event that this makes Cell Crater an excellent proxy for ancient Earth and what it might have looked for looked like before life arose. We can't go back in time, Niebuhr said, but we can go to Titan. The destination. When the Huygens probe landed on Titan in 2005, researchers had no idea what to expect. Huygens revealed a complex world covered in lakes of methane and ethane, filled with sandy dunes of organic materials, and with a complete methane cycle, analogous to Earth's water cycle. Meanwhile, the Cassini spacecraft kept watch from its orbit around Saturn for more than a decade, eventually learning to map Titan's surface in great detail. It was able to reveal Titan's lakes and seas growing and shrinking with the seasons. These rich details had scientists hungering for a dedicated Titan mission, which Dragonfly will now fulfill. Uh, let's see, Dragonfly's full mission will last almost two years because of Titan's slow movements. A full day on Titan lasts roughly 16 Earth days. Wow. No, that's the way it should be. One day lasts 16. That's more like it. Dragonfly will spend its eight-day days flying, communicating, and performing science tasks, and its eight-day nights recharging its batteries, with no station there. Impressive. It will perform most of its science from the ground, where it can directly access samples of Titan's surface and run them through its on-site laboratory. Dragonfly is part of NASA's New Frontiers program, which is responsible for the New Horizons mission to Pluto. The Juno mission currently studying Jupiter and OSIRIS-REx, what an interesting name, which is orbiting the asteroid Bennu and planning to return samples back to Earth. Researchers will have to wait more than a decade to see any results from Dragonfly. But Titan's complex world is surely worth the wait. All right, that's interesting. And they will also be searching for life, but we won't know about that. Titan's scoopy skies drizzling complex hydrocarbons onto the moon's surface, potentially providing the building blocks of life. Hmm. Wouldn't that be nice to have everything we need to survive or to sustain us drizzle from the sky? But enter the thunderbolts, and they say, not so fast. No, not so fast, Mr. Smarty Pants. The Great Titan Desert. July 1st, 2019. Quite current. Titan is not wet. On October 15th, 1997, NASA launched the six-ton Cassini-Huygens spacecraft, the largest space mission ever deployed at the time. Its name was changed twice during the mission. The Cassini Equinox mission was a two-year extension that began on July 1, 2008, following the completion of its prime mission from July 1, 2004 to June 30, 2008. It was then changed to the Cassini Solstice mission, named for the summer solstice on Saturn that took place May of 2017. Cassini burned up in Saturn's atmosphere, on Friday, September 16, 2017. Cassini's mission uncovered many problems. Methane gas escapes from Titan's atmosphere, where sunlight changes it back into carbon and hydrogen. Titan is supposed to be billions of years old. So how has its methane atmosphere survived? It should have evaporated eons ago. Astrophysicists resolve that issue by imagining large large lakes of liquid methane on the surface. That idea suffered a blow when Huygens' lander touched down on a rocky point. No methane rain was detected, and no methane puddles were seen. Instead, a vast, dry expanse covered with sand dunes and dry river channels was seen. Huygens used a probe attached to its bottom with a pressure sensor programmed with a variety of materials. The mission team reported that the lander felt something moist, but the data also indicated dry sand. Methane drifted around the probe, but quickly dissipated, presumably because of the lander's heat. According to a recent press release, planetary scientists analyzing Cassini's data archive found more anomalies. Titan, they speculate, has a weather cycle like Earth, except it involves methane instead of water. Evaporation clouds, rain, 
rivers, lakes, and seas are said to exist on Titan, despite its temperature of minus 220 Celsius. How those catchments were formed is a puzzle, since they do not fit well with computer models. And give a summary of my interest in position in the debate about the Saturnian configuration. I was one of the early science undergraduates in the late 50s who had read Velikovsky's works before in the halls of academia. To my surprise and profound disillusionment with quote-unquote experts, I soon discovered that this was not so. I then began to do what Dave has done and looked for further evidence, working on my own. So far as I know, I was the only science undergraduate who haunted the anthropology section of the library bookshelves. It was enough to convince me that there was a major case to be explored for a recent rearrangement of the solar system. I did not pursue the mytho-historical threads since my first love is astronomy, but I have applied the same principles in that field that Dave has done in his work, that is, pattern recognition and matching. The results have been very encouraging and interesting. I should state my prejudices concerning the present state of science. I would characterize the scientific age as being the age of Homo sapien ignoramus, to be specific about our ignorance in the areas most likely to affect the Saturnian configuration. I would list the following. Gravity. Einstein, with his geometric description of gravity, has held back understanding by the better part of a century. The most promising work in explaining gravity is being done by a handful of classical physicists who see it as a minute imbalance in electrostatic forces associated with fundamental particles. The recent announcement of the accidental discovery of gravitational shielding by a rotating superconductor seems congruent with the classical approach. It certainly could not be predicted from the current metaphysics of gravity theory. Electrical discharges, this is crucial. We do not understand what causes earthly lightning, so we are unlikely to acknowledge plasma discharges in space. The little plasma physics that astronomers are taught is flawed. The plasmas are electrically neutral and superconducting, they trap magnetic fields. So apart from gravity, magnetism is the only other force we hear about. We are told that energetic events on the sun are due to magnetic reconnection, whatever that means. The strongest force, barring nuclear, electrical, is never mentioned. We find it easy on Earth to generate x-rays using electric discharge, but astronomers insist on nature doing it the hard way in space. It is also not generally known that electrical discharges are very efficient at removing material against gravity and dumping it into space or onto another nearby object. Stars. We do not understand what makes them tick. As Ralph Jurgen said in the 70s, practically every feature of our sun has no business being there. If it is purely a thermonuclear engine radiating into space, magnetic fields do not occur without an associated electric current. The sun is essentially an extended conducting plasma subject to electric stress. The phenomenon we call the sun is purely a ball of lightning. That the Earth and other planets intercept some of the galactic plasma discharge is shown by the recent discovery of diffuse stratospheric discharges, sprites, x-rays, and gamma rays above earthly storms. This is a precise analog of the corona x-rays, chromospheric glow discharge, and photospheric lightning. Granulations are the tops of the discharges on the sun. The umbra of a sunspot gives us a glimpse of the true temperature of the body of the sun. As a result of this realization, it follows that the conventional stellar evolutionary story is pure fiction. Stars are what they are because of their environment. Their variability is caused by their environment, not their internal workings. This explains the speed with which some stars change their characteristics. Heavy elements are not built up slowly in supernovae, but at the surface of all stars in the non-thermal compression and acceleration of plasma discharges, granulations. Hence, 
nucleosynthesis and what little neutrino production there is fall as the sunspot number increases. The differential rotation of the sun, its magnetic field, and the sunspot cycle are all influenced by the sun's passage across large Birkeland currents, flowing along and defining the arms of our galaxy. Planet Formation The Laplacian theory and its variants are garbage. The Hubble Space Telescope has shown that in regions of star formation, large bodies are being shot out as if from a gun, which is peculiar if gravity is the operative force. Once again, plasma discharges provide a mechanism which can simply explain this. The view is that diffuse hydrogen and dust is efficiently scavenged and compressed by the well-known magnetic pinch effect of an electric current flowing along the arms of a galaxy. At some point, gravity takes over and stellar objects are formed. Beyond a certain size, protostars become electrically unstable and fission, spitting out some of the core and giving rise to one or more companions. So uh, there, I still think that the Herbie Harrow objects must might have something to do with the formation of planets as well. So there seems to be more than one way for a planet to be made. But when we're looking at planets, it's very possible that we could be looking at the core of a star. That's interesting. This explains the predilection for stars to be found in pairs or multiples. Got that right. Not all the matter ejected from the core of a protostar may coalesce into a companion star. It may be in the form of one or a number of gas giants. The recent discovery of a Jupiter-like body orbiting very close to a nearby star argues strongly for this model and against the standard theory. A gas giant, in turn, due to either internal or external electrical disturbance, may fission spitting out its core to give rise to the highly condensed planets, moons, asteroids, comets, etc. Cosmology All of the above gives rise to the conviction that cosmology should be in the hands of the, the plasma physics experimenters, not the theorists. It is ironic that they have been chasing the holy grail of fusion power, just like the sun, when that is patently wrong. Interestingly, a recent breakthrough in fusion energy research came about in my hometown, Canberra. When the researchers configured their plasma discharge in the form of a Birkeland current ring, a precise analog of that flowing along the arms of our galaxy. But astronomers will continue to be surprised by results pouring in from space probes when their fundamental paradigms rest on Newtonian and billiard ball physics. The current paradigm has no predictive power whatsoever. The book The Big Bang Never Happened by Eric J. Lerner is a pointer to the cosmology of the 21st century. So what are the patterns that apply from all of this to the Saturnian configuration, SC? The following are some ideas. One. The core discharge mechanism of planet formation is a plausible way to generate the SC, a string of objects with the largest near the middle. It's a Saturnian configuration, SC. Two, the reliance on the degree of electrical stress in the enveloping plasma for the characteristics of the larger bodies enclosed in that plasma could see rapid changes occur even the disruption of one of the stellar or gas giant objects. It could certainly involve jets of material being emitted by such bodies and forming a diffuse cloud enveloping the polar configuration. It could also be the destabilizing influence which finally breaks it up. 3. As seen in the high-speed objects shooting out of the Orion Nebula, Plasma discharges take place in the core of a star or gas giant. 
can result in considerable acceleration of the resultant debris. This may provide some of the source of the energy required to position Jupiter and Saturn much further out in our solar system. The redistribution of charge amongst objects in the solar radial field also requires that their orbits will change. 4. Charge bodies orbiting eccentrically in a radial electric field around the Sun will dissipate energy through electromagnetic induction heating in such a way as to quickly spiral into a circular orbit. For any object with a high eccentricity, electrical breakdown will occur within its Langmuir sheath and cometary discharge phenomena will be seen, regardless of its size. Venus 5. If gravity is essentially an electrostatic phenomenon, the unusual environment of the Saturnian configuration could be expected to have caused a difference in the perceived gravity at the surface of the Earth. It is conceivable that the electric stress within the plasma sheath enclosing the SC was less than that which the Earth endures in its current solar environment. This would result in an effect of lower gravity. The breakup of the SC would have caused a sudden change. An interesting sidelight to this idea is that the apparent very low density of Saturn may be due to the use of a universal gravitational constant in the determination. There may be no such thing. Measurements of G in laboratories on Earth don't seem to agree. In Saturn's electrical environment, we may have shared an apparent low gravity. 6. Various odd phenomena associated with plasma discharges would have been observed from Earth and should appear in ancient depictions of the SC. These include helical, serpentine glows surrounding a central column or twined rope-like around each other. These would be representations of Brooklyn currents flowing between planets enveloped in the same plasma sheath. The number of strands may have varied and given rise to the depictions of Venus with different numbers of radiance. We should also look at the photographs from deep space of exploding stars. For clues to the imagery, since they are electric discharge phenomena writ large, one they could possibly look like rings around the column, or a series of flared skirts. Another effect is seen in discharge tubes filled with low-pressure gas, where a series of light and dark bands are formed transverse to the discharge axis. This might give rise to a kind of stairway to heaven or ziggurat appearance. Then there is the self-contained plasmoid, a corkscrew within an overall football shape which forms the interplanetary equivalent of lightning and appears to have been depicted as Zeus Thunderbolt. I have looked in some detail at chondritic meteorites which I expect to be leftovers from a planetary discharge event. They show all the characteristics to be expected of material that has been subjected to flash heating, acceleration, collision and ion implantation in a spatially restricted compressed gas stream together with isotopic modification by enhanced radiation followed by sudden cooling all the symptoms of a plasma discharge. I predicted that the features of the enigmatic chondrule shells could be reproduced in the lab in a plasma oven. A planetary discharge is a very effective way for Martian meteorites to have been created. Very strong evidence for planetary electrical scarring comes from the Magellan Orbiter images of Venus. Also, the Jovian moon Europa was presumably a part of the Saturnian configuration and would also have been subject to electrical scarring. I predict that when close-ups of Europa are available in December, the so-called cracks in the ice will be found to be electric discharge channels with the raised levees on either side of the dark light, dark cross section caused by discharge modification of the excavated material. 
in the manner of the green glass beads, formed from the melted soil excavated by an electric discharge along the lunar rails. 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 The cracks on Europa show no lateral displacement where they intersect, though displacement would be expected if they were due to shifting ice. Discharge channels will throw material from the younger channel into the older where they intersect. Cracks should not show this characteristic. After that, I need a long cold foster. Wall Thornhill. Silver Age and the Rise of the Blue Bloods. The legacy of the Saturn Death Cult and its effect on mankind really begins with the priesthoods of the Silver Age and the rise of the nobility, the Blue Bloods. Central to the existence of the new Silver Age priesthoods was the belief that what had destroyed the Golden Age could happen again. Utilizing the new technology of writing, they set about recording the cataclysmic events as the word to serve as a memory and a warning to future generations. These warnings formed the basis of secret societies within these priesthoods. Preparations were made to ensure survival should doomsday return. The advent of writing gave the priesthoods of the Silver Age the technology to keep alive the memories of the cataclysmic end to the Golden Age. As people began to forget how Saturn once ruled the heavens, the increasingly misunderstood records of the priesthoods would become the basis for the beliefs of mystery schools and secret societies down through the ages. The Second Age of Discovery A second great age of voyage and discovery ensued in which the refugees of the destroyed Golden Age civilizations determined to make a survey of their transformed world and cosmos and establish through their priesthoods the righteous and justice they perceived to be the legacy of that former age. Weights and measures and calendars were established and enshrined by law in a growing network of interlinked temples and monuments that span the globe. The Masonic mystery schools of the great civilization builders had arrived. Was Egypt's ancient civilization a legacy of refugees that had survived the great cataclysm and had brought the golden age to an end? Some esoteric traditions trace Egypt's past to Atlantis. Earth captures the moon. In keeping with the arrival of the Silver Age and its new sun, a new silvery marvel could now be seen in the heavens, Earth's moon. Captured by Earth and the distinctive chaos that was the Saturnian system's demise, was this white globe exhibited crescent-like phases under the sun's light that harkened back to the glory days of the Golden Age when Saturn's rings would be illuminated as crescents surrounding the former deity. It's a matter of conjecture of when Earth captured the moon. Contrary to popular belief, the moon's heavenly cratered surface is actually proof of extreme electrical strike activity due to the crater's almost uniformly perfect circular shapes. Meteorites and asteroids create angular impact craters and rarely hit celestial bodies at perfect 90 degree angles. Electrical experiments do, however, show electrical lightning produced the same kind of cratering as seen on the moon. The moon's craters can therefore not be used to date the age of the moon based on meteorite impacts, a rare event in any case throughout human history. The new moon proved an excellent keeper of time, yet its arrival would only serve to diminish the memory of the original crescents of Saturn and confuse the knowledge. Preserved in the masses of crescent-like symbols established by the priesthoods, Moon cults began to distort the original intent of these symbols. You know, that reminds me. I'm reminded of uh, that castle, the coral castle over there at Leeds Gallons. He's got crescents and Saturn in his uh, little abode there. I'm wondering if that's what he's referring to with some of his hints. The foundation of these early moon cults. Temples, priest kings, and the rise of international commerce. With the establishment of weights and measures, an excitingly new yet dangerously insidious concept began to take hold within the temples of priesthoods. The advent of the universal language of international commerce. The driving factor in the increase of trade in the Silver Age was the newly derived notion of money. At this time, money was issued in the form of clay tablet receipts against the production of goods by any given society or people. This clay tablet money was measured by and limited to the amount of goods that could be produced and stored in people's warehouse. The money was only as valuable as the amount of goods that 
were actually stored. This had been a central feature of the laws established by the priesthoods in ensuring equal weights and measures. However, discoveries in the mining of gold and silver quickly established a link between these metals and the idea of money. Due to the difficulty in counterfeiting these metals, it was realized that gold and silver could act as an alternative to clay tablets being used as money. This was especially useful when it came to trade between geographically separated peoples who could not verify other people's storehouses. But who would know that gold as an accepted store of value could not be faked? Unfortunately, this international element to trading quickly turned the new gold and silver money into commodities. One of the concepts most central to the system of study which comes out is the concept of immortality of our individual consciousness. There is a long mystical tradition extending back far beyond biblical times which posits a type of immortal soul. St. Paul in his epistles has distinguished between the human body and the spiritual body. Long before St. Paul's century, Egyptian priests had the concept of the Ka, and posited that this Ka, or spiritual personality, existed after death, and was the true repository of the essence of consciousness of the person who had lived the life. Egyptians, of course, made very elaborate arrangements for life after death. If life after death is posited as a probability, one may also posit life before birth, any mother who has had more than one child will testify to the undoubted fact that each child comes into his life or incarnation already equipped with a personality which cannot be explained by environment or heredity. After all the factors of both have been accounted for, there remains a unique personality with which the child seems to have been born. Each child has certain fears, which are not explainable in terms of the fears of the parents. A child, for instance, may be terrified of a thunderstorm. The rest of the family may be perfectly comfortable during such a storm. Another child may be extraordinarily gifted at the playing of an instrument when neither parent nor any relatives, as far back as the parents can remember, had musical ability. This brings us back to the serious consideration of reincarnation. According to the alleged UFO contact messages, reincarnation is one of the most important concepts to be grasped for through it the universe functions in order to advance the evolution of mankind. This evolution is seen to be not only physical, but also metaphysical, not only of the body, but also of the spirit. And incarnations are seen in this system of philosophy to be opportunities for an individual to continue his evolution through numerous and varied experiences. Although perhaps two-thirds of the world's population embraces or is familiar with a religious system which posits reincarnation, those of us of the Judeo-Christian culture are not as familiar with the concept. Nevertheless, Don's early investigations seem to indicate that reincarnation was a probability and that incarnations contained situations, relationships, and lessons which were far more easily understood in the light of knowledge of the previous incarnations. One succinct example of this relationship, which some are fond of calling karma, is that of a young boy who requests that his name not be used, who in this life had experienced such intense allergies to all living things that he could not cut the grass, smell the flowers, or during the blooming season spend much time at all outside. Under hypnotic regression, he experienced in detail a long life in England. He had been a solitary man whose nature was such as to avoid contact with any human being. He had inherited a fairly large estate, and he spent his life upon it. His one pleasure was the very extensive garden that he maintained. In it, he had his gardeners plant all manner of flowers, fruits, and vegetables. After the life had been discussed, and while the lad was still in trance, hypnotist Lauren Allison asked the boy, as he often did, to contact what is loosely referred to as his higher self. He had the boy ask his higher self if the lesson of putting people first and other things second had been learned. The higher self said that indeed the lesson had been learned. The hypnotist then had the boy ask the higher self if this allergy could be healed. 
since the lesson had been learned and the allergy was no longer necessary. The higher self agreed. The hypnotist then carefully brought the boy out of the hypnotic state, walked over to his piano on which was placed the magnolia. As magnolia blossoms will do, it had dropped its pollen on the polished surface of the piano. The hypnotist scraped the pollen into his hand, took it over to the boy, and deliberately blew it directly at the boy's nose. How could you do that to me? exclaimed the boy. You know how allergic I am. Oh, really? asked the hypnotist. I don't hear you sneezing. The boy remained cured of his allergy. When we attempt to consider our relationship with the universe, we begin to see that there is a great deal more in heaven and earth than has been dreamt of in most philosophies. It is an unbelievably gigantic universe, and if we have a true relationship to it, we must ourselves be more than or other than our daily lives seem to encompass. In the raw material, a good deal of information is discussed concerning our true relationship with the universe, but it is good to realize that we do have a long tradition of work upon what may perhaps most simply be called the magical personality. Magic is, of course, a much misused term, and is mostly understood as being the art of prestidigitation. Prestidigitation or illusion. When one sees a magician, one accepts the fact that one is seeing very skillfully performed illusions. However, there is a study of the so-called magical personality which suggests that there is a thread which runs through our daily lives which we can grasp and, using that thread, remove ourselves from time to time into a framework of reference points in which we see reality as being that of the spiritual body, that personality which exists from incarnation to incarnation, and indeed, since before the world was, by working upon this magical personality, by interiorizing experience, by accepting responsibility for all that occurs, and by eventually coming to a balance our reactions to all that occurs, so that our actions in our environment are generated within the self and are no longer simple reactions to outward stimulus. We strengthen the so-called magical personality until we are able to have some small claim to the art of causing changes in consciousness at will. This is the classic definition of magic. Each time that a person sustains an unfortunate situation and reacts to it by not giving anger for anger or sadness for sadness, but instead offering compassion and comfort where none is expected, we strengthen that thread of inner self within us, and we become more and more associated with a life that is closely related to the organic evolution of the universe. It is some sense of the wholeness or organic nature of the universe which best informs the student of the UFO's purposes in being here. They have been here, by many accounts, for thousands of years. At least UFOs have been mentioned, along with many other strange sites in the annals of all early histories, including the Bible. However, as we look for the heart of the cosmic system of philosophy, we find much that is clear and simple, without being simplistic in the least, much that is ethical without being dogmatic, in short, much that is informative. The nature of reality, which in the main seems to have escaped the notice of man. Man on earth has become very short-sighted in appreciation of the creation. He does not understand the true meaning of the simple and beautiful life that surrounds him. That reminds me of uh, Velikovsky's diagnosis of scotoma. He does not appreciate its generation and regeneration. He learns that the very atmosphere that he breathes is cycled through the plant life to be regenerated to support him and his fellow beings and creatures. And yet this seems to the vast majority of those who dwell upon this planet to be an exercise in technology rather than one in theology. There is no awareness of the Creator's plan to provide for his children, to provide for their every desire, and to provide a state of perfection. Man on earth has lost his awareness that is rightfully his. And why has he lost this awareness? He has lost this because he has focused his attention upon devices and inventions of his own. He has become hypnotized 
by his playthings and his ideas. He is but a child in his mind. All of this may be very simply remedied, and man can once more return to an appreciation of reality rather than an appreciation of the illusion created by his mind. All that is necessary is that he individually avail himself to this appreciation of reality through the process of meditation. For this process stills his active curious mind, which is continually seeking stimulus within the illusion developed over so many centuries of time upon planet Earth. Very rapidly, then, he can return to an appreciation of the reality and the functioning of the real creation. This is what man of Earth must return to if he is to know reality. The simple thought of absolute love, a thought of total unity with all of his brothers, regardless of how they might express themselves or whom they might be, for this is the original thought of your Creator. The creation of the Father, then, has a very simple nature. A nature in which love is the essence of all things and all their functions. I've always felt that. The answer is love. The creation of the Father then, yet this real creation obviously is not uppermost in most of our minds because we live in a day-to-day -day atmosphere quite often as an, is an illusion. because we have availed ourselves to them, just as the people of your planet may do. It is possible through meditation to totally reduce the illusion that you now experience that creates the separation, an illusory separation to what it actually is, a total illusion. We have been continuing to speak to you about meditation. We have spoken to you many times about reality and about love and understanding. And yet, you do not seem to be able to overcome the illusion. The reason for the illusion is one that man on earth has generated. He has generated it out of desire. The illusion is useful. It is very useful for those who would wish to evolve at a very rapid rate by experiencing it and by using it while within it. Many of us who are now circling your planet would desire to have the opportunity to that you have. The opportunity to be within the illusion and then, through the generation of understanding, use the potentials of the illusion. This is a way of gaining progress spiritually and has been sought out by many of our brothers. I cannot overemphasize the necessity of becoming able to understand the nature of the potentials within your illusion and then, by self-analysis and meditation, reacting to that in a way that will express the thought that generated us, the thought of our Creator. This was done by the teacher whom you know is Jesus. This man recognized his position. He recognized the illusion. He understood the reasons for the potentials within the illusion. And his reaction to these potentials and activities within the illusion was a reaction which was expressing the thought of the Creator, a thought of love. Keep uppermost in your mind that the illusion that you experience is an illusion that is surrounding you for the purpose of teaching you. It can only teach you if you become aware of its teachings. It is said that he worked his wonders in mysterious ways. This way may seem mysterious. However, it is the only spiritual evolvement. It is the way of spiritual evolvement. There are many souls experiencing the illusion in which you find yourself. However, there are few using this illusion to grow. They are not doing this other than at a subliminal level because they have not availed themselves through their seeking to a knowledge of the possibility of doing this. Once an individual has become aware of the possibility of using the illusion in which he finds himself in your physical world for the progression of spiritual growth, it is necessary that he take the next step and use his knowledge to express, regardless of the potentials which affect him, the love and understanding of his Creator. For some reason, I just got the thought of uh, that CD by Guns N' Roses, Use Your Illusion. I mean, how could, how could some 20-somethings come up with something that deep? Is, is that stuff given to them to perform and do? Many who say that military intelligence and the CIA run the music business. I really don't know if that's true, but I have heard that a few times. Or did that come really from Axl Rose's mind? 
I've often wondered that. Obviously, he must have been piped into something that was like an antenna that was coming to him. I, uh, you know, I have many, many good, great songwriters like um, Keith Richard, Bob Dylan, many others. They, they say that they're just an antenna, that the information is already there and they just pick it up. I think Tesla said the same thing. The information is all around us. That's why this article struck me. I really do think that we send out vibes to the universe and it sends them back to us and that everything is God or the Creator. Everything. And uh, why I wanted to share it with you. I think it has an important message in it. If nothing else, we can take that with us. As you have now become aware, meditation is always suggested as the best means of attaining understanding, of progressing spiritually, and of understanding the nature of the illusion and the purpose for which you are experiencing it. Each person is involved in an illusion or game in which we may, if we wish, use our consciousness in meditation in such a way as to create a more rapid growth in personal evolution. But how do we bring ourselves to the point at which this process, which often seems very difficult, is grasped and begun? Desire, my friends, is the key to what you receive. If you desire it, you shall receive it. This was the Creator's plan, a plan in which all of His parts would receive exactly what they desire. Often in the illusion which you now experience, it seems that you do not acquire what you desire. In fact, the opposite seems to be the case in many instances. It is a paradox. It seems that such a statement should be made and that such apparent results of desire are manifested. And yet we state without exception that man receives exactly what he desires. Perhaps, my friends, you do not understand desire. Perhaps this understanding is not within our intellect, the intellectual mind. Perhaps it will be necessary to spend time in meditation to become aware of your real desire. There is much, much more of you and of the creation than you presently appreciate with your intellectual abilities in your present illusion. It is very difficult for peoples of this planet to give up their illusion, to give up the preconceived knowledge of what they believe to be cause and effect. However, this is not reality. This is illusion, born of illusion. It is a simple product of the complexity that man upon this planet has generated. Join with us in divorcing your thinking from such complexities and become aware of what has created you, everything that you experience, everything that is thought. Become aware of your Creator. Become aware of His desire. And when you know this desire, you will know your own. For you and your Creator are one, and you are one with all of His parts. And therefore, all of your fellow beings throughout all of the creation, when you know His desire, you will feel it. There will be no more confusion. There will be no more questions. You will have found what you have sought. You will have found love. For this is the desire of your Creator, that all His parts express and experience the love that created you. This can be found simply in meditation. No amount of seeking within the intellectual concepts of your people, no amount of careful planning or careful interpretation of the written or spoken word will lead you to the simple truth. One of the concepts most central has a very simple nature. Experience. Relationships. There are many who say that military intelligence and the CIA run the music business. I really don't know if that's true, but I have heard that a few times. So when we just meditate, answers come to us. I guess it would. I don't do much meditating. We arrive, therefore, at our first critical juncture, an acid test. Can a mere seven categories actually in purple dawn of mankind? In the beginning, there was only darkness. Yet, in that darkness, there was already Raven. He was still small and weak, and his special powers had not fully developed. From an Eskimo creation myth, Raven being their version of the Saturn archetype. C.M. Wood, Heroes and Hunters, from North American Indian Mythology. New York, 1982, page 17.
Before the golden age of Saturn, or Kronos, as he was known to the Greeks, a time in which mankind was said to have enjoyed a tranquil and plentiful existence, bathed in the flawless light of a perfect and timeless sun, there was a primordial dawn of eternal twilight. In the earliest legend, with which the recital, i.e. the Kojiki, opens, one recognizes the primal myth, the development from a primordial darkness and chaos. This is the Kronos legend, in its thousand forms, the father of all mythologies, upon which so many peoples have constructed their cosmogonies. P. Wheeler, The Sacred Scriptures of the Japanese, New York, 1952, page 387, as quoted by Dordo Cordona, Godstar, 2006. Some mythological cycles feature a primitive age of darkness before the existence of the sun, when human beings lived in a state of anarchy without the techniques of civilized life. H. Osborne, South American Mythology, Mythology of the Americas, London, 1970, page 294, is quoted with emphasis by Dordo Cordona, Godstar, 2006, page 278. Note in the second of the two above quotes, the reference to an age of darkness before the existence of the sun. According to E. A. S. Butterworth, the sun of the ancients is not the natural sun of heaven, for it neither rises nor sets, but is, as it seems, ever in the zenith above the navel of the world. There are signs of an ambiguity between the pole star and the sun. Yet those words belie what mythology is inferring when it speaks of an age of darkness. We should not construe this age to be one that was black as night, but rather that the available light was subdued and hued with a distinctive color that would come to be associated with Saturn. Take a wage tell Ponticutli, an alter ego for Quetzalcoatl, Aztec Saturn, who is credited as being the first light at creation, is the god of the dawn light that was created before the sun. The Roman poet Martinius Capella provides a clue as to what color this light was when he has the goddess Harmonia declaring that the rays from the god Jupiter renew the purple dawn for men. An obvious reference to a previous age before Jupiter's ascent in place of Saturn. The Hopi tribe of North America have songs that talk of a dark purple light of creation coming from the north, while the Chinese still refer to the celestial northern pole region as the purple pole. In all cases, and many others, the color purple is linked to Saturn, especially during a primordial time remembered in mythology as the dawn of creation. What this tells us is that there once was a distantly ancient age wrapped in a sea of dark celestial purple, a purplish light that radiated a dense and global warmth that seems to have emanated from a single dull orb shining at a time well before the arrival of the sun we see today this glowing disk appears to have been permanently stationed at the far north of the heavens as the late researcher Gordu cardona surmised the evidence of myth which points to saturn having once occupied a position above earth's north polar regions is voluminous there is not a race on earth that has not preserved at least one account which states as much According to this evidence, Saturn occupied a central position in the north celestial regions. It rotated, and rotated widely, but other than that, it was immovable. Dordu Cardona, 1978. It is this darkened and primordial sun, this dull and immovable orb, that would eventually become the god and planet known as Saturn. But before Saturn rose to his status as the great creator god of mythology, Primordial man spoke of this time as the great dream time of our distant past, a time celebrated in the oral and written traditions of ancient peoples the world over. Like a man was the sun when it showed itself. It showed itself when it was born and remained fixed in the sky like a mirror. Certainly, it was not the same sun which we see. It is said in their old tales, the Papal Vu, Mesoamerican creation story. According to this understanding, at that time, there was no bright yellow sun as we know it today, one that rises in the east and sets in the west. There was no way to calculate the passage of time, to tell day from night. No stars could be seen through the dense atmospheric purple haze that engulfed the heavens. There was no moon from which to tell the passing of time by its phases, or by which the earth's oceans could be influenced by great tidal forces. Humanity lived in a perpetual state of dusky darkness, everything wrapped within a warm and bountiful purple hue that permeated all existence and in which the nocturnal thrived. 
like a giant blind reddish purple eye looking onto the world from within a swirling heavenly purple chaos primordial man would have seen saturn as a single pale disk of light radiating its benign presence from a position locked at earth's celestial north it had always been there a presence that was an integral yet silently ethereal part of the earth's landscape and mankind's experience for how long this state of affairs had lasted it is impossible to tell how life on earth may have looked during the age known as the purple dawn when earth was in orbit around the primordial saturn circa 100,000 bc saturn can be seen in its primeval state as magenta-hued sub-brown dwarf star saturn's famous rings had not yet formed at this time the murky existence of life on earth as suggested in the earliest mythological narratives and portrayed in the previous image would have belied the even and global warmth that allows humans to walk unclothed and untroubled by weather extremes while a semi-nocturnal world seems at odds with modern concepts of what would be a healthy planetary environment the supposed need for a bright sunlight and rotating calendar of seasons to support life is overstated all that would be required for the sustaining of a habitable planet is precisely what the myth suggests primordial man enjoyed an adequate amount of evenly radiated heat energy within the medium red blue light spectrum required for photosynthesis in predominantly phycobilin based plants much in the same way that we observe coastal areas supporting submerged red algae under the filtrating effects of the oceans so too would the earth's primordial environment under saturn have enjoyed a radiating filtered heat in which red hued vegetation would have flourished a collection of pioneering alternative theorists have in recent decades sought to identify this dull primordial sun of mythology as having been a brown dwarf star a fairly common celestial object that would have radiated energy in the red blue purple spectrum rather than the red green bright light of the sun we see today accordingly when factoring ancient descriptions of the god Saturn in his primordial state, we can determine that if Saturn was indeed a brown dwarf star, then Saturn would have typically produced its own far-reaching heliosphere, or what electric universe proponents call a plasma sheath, a type of electrical bubble which would have extended out into space like a giant egg-like cocoon. The startling supposition is that an electric cocoon of this type would have embraced the earth and all its inhabitants. Inside of this hypothesized plasma bubble would have acted like a dull mirror, a reflective field that would have uniformly bounced the star's warm radiation back onto all parts of the planet's surface to produce an even purplish primordial glow related to us by these ancient traditions. Its reflected light and energy would have produced warm regions at both poles while almost entirely negating meteorological effects like wind and rain, weather features so common today under our current sun. To the ancients of the golden, silver, and bronze ages, this dull, moon-like disk from the time of the purple dawn came to be identified as the sleeping form of the god Kronos, Greek, or Saturn, Latin. In other cultures, it would come to be known as Ra, Egyptian. Oh, okay. Enlo, Mesopotamia, Tlaloc, Aztec, later transformation into Quetzalcoatl, and Shangdi, China. Though modern mythologists would later confuse many of these deities as being representations of our current yellow sun, an alternative interpretation of comparative mythology suggests they all share common identity traits with the Roman god Saturn, who was in turn identified directly with the planet Saturn. And that's the problem, is these interpretations later changed a lot of these gods. I've noticed that. Locating Earth's original geomagnetic North Pole. It is important to note that Earth's geomagnetic pole would have been in a completely different position at this time to where it is today. Hat tip to Ted Holden. With Earth's current geographic North Pole region having been originally pointed at its original brown dwarf sun. Geomagnetic field would have necessarily still been orientated in line with its then celestial north 
despite its phase-locked equatorial relationship with Saturn. However, this would have been positioned a phase-locked Earth geomagnetic north pole in a very different position. The best contender for where primordial Earth's geomagnetic north could once have been is strongly suggested by two significant bulges in the Earth's crust. These two bulges happen to be on opposite sides of the Earth to each other. The larger one is called the Pacific Bulge, and it is located on the northern Pacific's ocean floor between Hawaii and Asia. The smaller bulge is located on the opposite side of the planet in the South Atlantic. If Earth's current northern polar region was once always once pointed at Saturn as it's orbited in phase lock, then Earth's geomagnetic north might likely have been located where the Pacific Bulge is today. Being the bigger of the two opposing bulges, the Pacific Bulge is the best candidate for Earth's original point of geomagnetic north. The bulge having been a possible consequence of Earth's original and differently orientated geomagnetic gravitational forces. The same would have been true, to a lesser degree, in the creation of the opposing Atlantic African bulge. Currently, Earth also has significant bulges in the Arctic and Antarctic regions, where the current geomagnetic North Pole and South Poles are found. In the age of the dinosaurs, Earth's distant primordial phase-locked relationship with Saturn was most likely the environment experienced by the dinosaurs while they still walked the earth. Most animals are nocturnal by nature. The permanent gloom of this time would have suited any nocturnal species, including dinosaurs. The heavy ultraviolet light shed by Saturn was the same beneficial ultraviolet light used today by reptilian pet owners to provide their pets with a basking spot in their enclosures. Reptiles in particular find this kind of ultraviolet light to their liking, as do most species of insects that see best in ultraviolet spectrum. Saturn's infrared spectrum would have also served most mammals well, the vast majority of which are nocturnal. While mammals internally produce their own vitamin C, pigs and humans are the salient exception. Under these postulated Saturnian light conditions, pigs and humans would have needed to eat sources of vitamin C in order to stay healthy. The previous image, Earth during the age of the dinosaurs. The primordial brown dwarf star Saturn sat stationary as Earth orbited Saturn in phase lock. The future Arctic region was always pointed at Saturn, while its geomagnetic north pole was most likely situated where the present Pacific bulge is located. A permanent purple twilight saturated the Earth with Saturn's plasma bubble appearing like a vast heavenly chaotic ocean. The even purple-hued light shed by Saturn and its plasma bubble cast no shadows and the air was generally still. No rain clouds formed on the Earth, but Saturn's water misted down onto Earth's surface in a dense and humid vapor. Saturn's ultraviolet light spectrum would have been highly beneficial for nocturnal reptilian species, the megafauna giants of the past. Earth's electrical relationship to its primordial brown dwarf star Saturn would have produced a variable and lesser gravity, according to the Electric Universe principles. This would have allowed for the development of gigantic proportions in many species, most now extinct due to Earth's heavier gravity. When the gigantic fossilized remains of dinosaurs were first discovered, it was assumed that creatures this large would have had to, to buoy their massive weights by spending their lives in marshes and swamps. But subsequent discoveries have conclusively proven that these monsters spent their lives on dry land. They became the impossible dinosaurs because nobody could work out how their physical structures would have supported their own bulk under current gravitational conditions. Much has been postulated in attempts to explain this challenge to the accepted modern day physics model that calls for Earth's gravity to have been a constant throughout its existence. These explanations have been inconclusive in the opinion of this writer, mostly because they are usually an effort to fit the evidence of the fossil record with the gravitational environment we observe today. But the more obvious solution is that the dinosaurs, and even some more of the recent mammalian giants, must have thrived during a time when gravity was much weaker. Earth once enjoyed a nocturnal-like purple glow and a lower level of gravity during much of its pre-human past. This would have facilitated not only the development of larger animals and insects, 
but also much larger plants and trees. A thick, oxygen-rich atmosphere during Earth's earliest existence would have contemplated its lesser gravity to allow for the flight of the huge pteranodons and the giant insects that we know existed in the very distant past. The successful flight of such creatures under current gravity is doubtful, actually impossible. The Shadow of Death An entire year after the eruption of Krakatoa, in the East Indies in 1883. Sunset and sunrise in both hemispheres were very colorful. Lava dust suspended in the air and carried around the globe accounted for this phenomenon. In 1783, after the eruption of Skaptar Jokul in Iceland, the world was darkened for months. Records of this phenomenon are known in many contemporary authors. One German contemporary compared the gloomy world of the year 1783 with the Egyptian plague of darkness. The world was gloomy in the year of Caesar's death, 44 BC. After the murder of Caesar, the dictator, and during the Antonine War, there was almost a whole year's continuous gloom, wrote Pliny. Virgil described this year in these words. The sun veiled his shining face in dusky gloom. Godless age feared everlasting night. Germany heard the clash of arms through all the sky. The Alps rocked with unwanted terrors, and specters, pale in wondrous wise, were seen at evening twilight. Who writes this stuff? That's magnificent. On September 23rd, 44 BC, a short while after the death of Caesar, on the very day when Octavian performed the rites in honor of the deceased, a comet became visible at daytime. It was very bright and moved from north to west. It was seen for only a few days and vanished while still in the north. It appears that the gloom which enveloped the world the year after Caesar's death was caused by the dust of the comet dispersed in the atmosphere. The clash of arms heard through all the sky was probably the sound that accompanied the entrance of the gases and dust into the Earth's atmosphere. If the eruption of a single volcano can darken the atmosphere over the entire globe, a simultaneous and prolonged eruption of thousands of volcanoes would blacken the sky. And if the dust of the comet of 44 BC had a darkening effect, contact of the Earth with a great cinder-trailing comet of the 15th century before this era could likewise cause the blackening of the sky. Chapter 6 A Collective Amnesia At any rate, they seem to have been strangely forgetful of the catastrophe. Plato laws. That's the I one thing. In the learning about human mind, the most terrifying events of childhood, in some cases even manhood, are often forgotten, their memory blotted out from consciousness and displaced into the unconscious strata of the mind, where they continue to live to express themselves in bizarre forms of fear. Occasionally, there may be converted into symptoms of compulsion neurosis and even contribute to the splitting of the personality. One of the most terrifying events in the past of mankind was the conflagration of the world, accompanied by awful apparitions in the sky, quaking of the earth, vomiting of lava by thousands of volcanoes, melting of the ground, boiling of the sea, submersion of the continents, a primeval chaos bombarded by flying hot stones, the roaring of the cleft earth, and the loud hissing of tornadoes of cinders. There occurred more than one world conflagration. The most horrible one was in the days of the Exodus, in hundreds of passages in their Bible. The Hebrews described what happened. Returning from the Babylonian exile in the 6th and 5th centuries before this era, the Hebrews did not cease to learn and repeat the traditions, but they lost sight of the fearful reality of what they learned. Apparently, the post-exile generations looked upon all these descriptions as the poetic utterances of religious literature. The Talmudists in the beginning of this era disputed whether a deluge of fire 
prophesized in old traditions would take place or not. Those who denied it might come base their argument on divine promise found in the book of Genesis. The deluge would not be repeated. Those who argued to the contrary reasoning that though the deluge of water would not reoccur, there might come a deluge of fire. We're attacked for construing too narrowly the promise of the Lord. Both sides overlooked the most prominent part of their traditions, the history of the Exodus and all the passages about the cosmic catastrophe endlessly repeated in Exodus, Numbers, and Prophets, and the rest of the scriptures. The Egyptians in the 6th pre-Christian century knew about the catastrophes that overwhelmed other countries. Plato narrates the story which Solon heard in Egypt about the world destroyed in deluges and conflagrations. You remember but one deluge, though many catastrophes have occurred previously. The Egyptian priests who said this and who maintained that their land was spared on these occasions forgot what happened to Egypt when, in the Ptolemaic age, the priest Manetho starts his story of the invasion of the Hyksos by acknowledging his ignorance of the cause and nature of the blast and heavenly displeasure that befell his land, it becomes apparent that the knowledge which was possibly alive in Egypt in the days when Salon and Pythagoras visited there had already sunk into oblivion in the Ptolemaic age. Only some hazy tradition about a conflagration of the world was repeated without knowing when or how it occurred. The Egyptian priest described by Plato as conversing with Salon supposed that the memory of the catastrophe of fire and flood had been lost because literate men perished in them. Together with all the achievements of their culture and the upheavals escaped your notice because for many generations the survivors died with no power to express themselves in writing. A similar argument is found in Philo, the Alexandrian, who wrote in the first century of this era, by reason of the constant and repeated destructions of water and fire, the later generations did not receive from the former the memory of the order and sequence of events. Although Philo knew about the repeated destructions of the world by water and fire, it did not occur to him that a catastrophe of conflagration was described in the book of Exodus, nor did he think that anything of this sort took place in the days of Joshua, or even of Isaiah. He thought that the book of Genesis comprised the story of how fire and water wrought great destruction on what is on the earth, and the destruction by fire about which he knew from the teachings of the Greek philosophers was identical with the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. The memory of the cataclysms was erased, not because of the lack of written traditions, but because of some characteristic process that later caused entire nations together with their literate men to read into these traditions, allegories, and metaphors where actually cosmic disturbances were clearly described. It is a physiological phenomenon in the life of individuals as well as whole nations that the most terrifying events of the past may be forgotten or displaced into the subconscious mind, as if obliterated. Our impressions that should be unforgettable to uncover their vestiges and their distorted equivalents in the physical life of people is a task not unlike that of overcoming amnesia in a single person. End of subchapter.